doesn't help anyone and doesn't take any of these issues forward in a reasonable and considered way. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 13246 in the name of Angela Constance on equity and excellence in education. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now and I'll give a few moments for the front benches to settle themselves. Thank you. I now call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 14 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, I want to uh, start by informing Chamber that I issued a correction and an apology uh, to yourself as President Officer and to Mr Michael McMahon, MSP, due to an inadvertent error uh, that I made uh, during general question time on the fifth the 13th of May and I just wanted to take the first opportunity where I've been on my feet in chamber to put that uh, on the record. Presiding officer, the education of our children is one of our greatest responsibilities so it is right that we debate and discuss our education system with frankness, with conviction and always with our children's best interest at heart. And the experience of our children's learning in schools here in Scotland it has changed greatly for the better in recent years. So we look to the future from a position of strength. And there is much to be proud of. Since 2007, we have delivered a 45% increase in childcare to 600 hours, providing more hours of childcare and early learning than any other part of the UK. We have secured agreements with local authorities to maintain teacher numbers, uh, providing £51 million to do so. We have delivered improvements in class sizes in primary one, achieved record exam passes in 2014-15, with a record number of higher passes gained. We have reduced the proportion of young people uh, from the most deprived communities leaving school with no or very low levels of qualifications, from 9.7% in 2007-08 to 5% in 2013-14. And we've secured positive destinations for a record number of school leavers at 92.3%, up from 86.6% in 06-07. And we've overseen a fall of just under a quarter, 22%, in youth unemployment over the past 12 months to its lowest in six years. And we've allocated over £100 million over four years in the Attainment Scotland Fund to close the attainment gap uh, between children in the most and least deprived communities. And we've also, presiding officer, rebuilt or refurbished uh, 526 schools. Presiding officer, this is a substantial set of achievements, but of course there is much more still to do, and there will always be much more to do. And while we have halted the recent decline in PISA scores, overall we remain mid-table, similar to most, better than many, not as good as some. And the recent SSLN scores also make plain that while attainment is high for most children in literacy and numeracy, there are some worrying indications of decline at particular stages, especially children from our most deprived communities. And our challenge is now to deliver equity and excellence for all, so that every child in every community gets every chance to succeed at school and in life. And as Teaching Scotland's Future recognises, the foundations of a successful education system lie in the quality of teachers and their leadership. And teachers, presiding officer, are key to all that has been achieved so far and will remain so. As part of a significant long-term effort to raise teacher quality, we have invested over £5 million since 2012, supporting initiatives in teacher professional learning. But we must also ensure that new teachers have the skills and confidence that they need to teach literacy and numeracy to the highest of standards. And every teacher training course must spend sufficient time and resources on these basic skills. 
And indeed, in this next phase of embedding curriculum for excellence, we cannot afford to stand still. Our shared focus must be delivering equity and excellence for all. And the starting point must be the evidence about what works within Scotland, but also internationally. So next week, as long planned, we welcome an international expert team from the OECD to undertake an authoritative, independent review of our performance. And we expect to receive the final report from the OECD before the end of this year. And this will provide a clear and unbiased assessment and will be fundamental to how we take things forward. There is also much that we can learn from other countries. In Ontario recently, I saw how effective their focus on a small number of key priorities could be. And I am sure that this would be beneficial in Scotland too, particularly if we consider underpinning these with a statutory framework. Poseidon Officer, I want to talk about five priorities that I think are particularly important. Firstly, I have already stressed that we must tackle iniquity in Scottish education, addressing the impact of poverty and austerity, but also not allowing it to be an excuse for leaving some children behind. We cannot and must not underplay the role poverty plays. Scotland is one of the richest countries in the developed world, yet tens of thousands of families are dependent upon food banks and poverty is on the rise in our country for the first time in a decade. And this government is committed to doing everything within its power to eradicate poverty in Scotland through our welfare fund, bedroom tax support, council tax reduction scheme, emergency food action plan and free school meals for primary one to three children. Of course. Joanne Lamont. Idea that you prepared that nothing is off the table, but could you explain to me how a council tax freeze benefits people who are living most in poverty, given they would not be paying council tax um, if they were living with those levels of income? Angela Constance. Well, I mean, Ms. Lamont will be aware that you know poverty affects people that are on benefits, but it also affects people that are currently in work. And we know that given the, the state of the economy, we have lived through some really challenging times. And that also includes people who aren't entitled to any benefits, um, but by you know, modern standards would not be considered to be paid um, excessively. And I do think you know, there is something in benefits that are available uh, to, to everyone. So I'm actually proud of the fact that the council tax reduction scheme um, has been part of uh, this, 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 the social wage. Poseidon officer, I recognise and deplore the effect of austerity and poverty and the impact that that can have on the life chances of Scotland's children. But it will never be acceptable for poverty to be an excuse for any child's lack of success at school. And already there is outstanding practice in our communities. And one example is Langley Primary in Gala Shields, which has paid forensic attention to their data, which showed that children were making good progress in reading in primary one to two, but that this progress dropped off thereafter. And through engagement with the Raising Attainment for All programme, the school is addressing this and literacy skills are improving. So it is within our gift to raise attainment and close the equity gap and targeted interventions using evidence of progress can really make a difference. And that is why the First Minister, that is why the First Minister launched the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge earlier this year. Liz Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that and I think she's absolutely right to point to that very good example of how uh, attainment can be raised. Could she just explain what the situation might be in terms of putting that into a national framework? The well, I mean, I think that's a very opposite point. And the second point that I was going on to, to raise and the issues that I think uh, are very important and the issues that we need to debate uh, this afternoon is that as we implement uh, initiatives such as the Attainment Challenge, we do need to gather reliable data on experiences and on attainment and to use that um, intelligently. And data which shows us not just what is working, but why and for whom 
and in what circumstances. And a lot of the work that is uh, taking place within the Raisin Attainment for All programme, I think, will be imperative um, as we move forward uh, in our discussions with everybody across the sector about the shape and substance of the, the National Improvement Framework. It is important, President Officer, to help ensure that when we are gathering uh, information, um, as I announced, um, that we will work with partners uh, to develop that national improvement framework, and that that framework, crucially, has to have um, the buy-in and support of teachers and others in the system. As the First Minister said in this chamber on Thursday, we're not going to jump to making decisions about the detail uh, of that framework before we've properly considered and continue to discuss with all our partners uh, how best we should move forward with this. And I firmly believe that that's the, the right thing to do. But documenting children's progress in literacy as a core basic skill is vital to understanding how children are doing at school generally, and we need to collate such data in a consistent and proportionate way. And I can therefore confirm today that I will be making additional tools such as reading score assessments available to the Raising Attainment for All programme to help them achieve uh, improved literacy and numeracy. And we will explore with these schools how their experiences of working with data can inform, as I said, the development of the National Improvement Framework. Thirdly, presiding officer, preparing children to succeed in life and for the world of work uh, through success at school has to be uh, a key and central goal. I am particularly passionate about the developing young workforce agenda. Uh, this will transform our approach to tackling systemic youth unemployment, offering a new wave of vocational pathways accessible to all young people that start in school and crucially allow progression to college, university, training or a job. And I believe that this will usher in a genuine personalisation of the senior phase of the curriculum for excellence. Developing Scotland's young workforce is crucial to building a fairer society, tackling inequality and ensuring sustainable uh, economic growth. The first thing I want to speak about, presiding officer, is that through all of this work, uh, we need to recognise and support the role of parents. Evidence shows that parents' involvement in their child's education, taking an interest, helping out with homework, uh, providing motivation and moral support has a significant and positive impact. But we also know that there are parents and families who do not feel a positive connection uh, with their child's school or their education. And our efforts to encourage more parents back into work, of course, create other challenges as many parents re-enter the labour market at a time when their children also start school. So we need to overcome the barriers which exist. And our education system needs to reach out to parents and develop real channels for two-way communication. And we know that good practice exists uh, but across the education system, we need to think more creatively about when and how we interact with parents. Of course. Mary Scanlon. I, I, I mean, I'm listening to what you're saying about opportunities and, and very much support that. But many opportunities are, are limited by the level of literacy. Are you concerned in teacher training colleges in Scotland as little as 20 hours in a four-year course yeah. are allocated to literacy co training compared to a minimum of 90 hours in England. It was a Freedom of Information request from Stuart Maxwell that gave that information. Andrew Absolutely, Carlson. Mrs Scanlon. And uh, several pages ago, I think I uh, tried to address that. And that is something that I have certainly reflected upon greatly because, to my knowledge, it was first raised in this chamber, uh, certainly in my capacity as education system, uh, Secretary by Stuart Maxwell, I think the last time that we had a debate on attainment and education. And it is something uh, that I will seek to address further uh, with the providers of initial teacher education uh, and also the GTCS. But it's an important point that if we want our children uh, to be achieving literacy and numeracy levels at the highest levels, we therefore need to consider uh, about what support uh, we give to people, uh, particularly uh, as they enter the profession. Presiding officer, I want to finish by touching upon the needs of a group of children that are hugely important. 
And we know that children who experience a secure, loving and nurturing home environment are better able to withstand life's challenges and achieve uh, their full potential. And that's why we're developing a national mentoring scheme to provide an opportunity for looked after children and young people to build long term relationships uh, with a supportive, uh, reliable, trustworthy adult who is consistently there for them. And earlier this year, I announced funding of half a million pounds per year with the intention that this will eventually be available to all looked after children and young people right across Scotland. And we have to understand that inequality and disadvantage comes in many forms and understanding and tackling poverty and income inequality is important, but so too is supporting looked after children and other children with additional support needs. Finally, presiding officer, uh, my aims are clear. I want to have an education system in Scotland which achieves equity and excellence based squarely on the professionalism and dedication of our teachers. And in doing that, I will be led by the evidence and not by dogma or ideology. And that should be the ambition of us all. And everyone in this chamber has a contribution to make to help realise that ambition. And this is a good time to be taking stock of both our successes and indeed our shortcomings. And this is a good time to consider what next for Scottish education. And it's a good time for us to be collectively looking to the future and charting a course to a destination where every child and every community has every chance to succeed. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks. And I now call on Ian Gray to speak to and move Amendment 13246.2. Mr Gray, ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to move the amendment in my name. The Government's motion this afternoon is properly in the name of the Education Secretary, but we do know that it carries the weight of the First Minister behind it. Ms Sturgeon told us once again yesterday in the pages of the Daily Record, no less, that her own education is the reason she is now First Minister and that it is her sacred responsibility to ensure that every child in Scotland gets the same chances she did. In this, she is not that different from many of us. I, too, am the first in my family to go to university, to start working life in one of the professions, and that will be true of many of us here. The difference is that the First Minister has been part of the government for the past eight years, and if, as she says, our education system is not good enough, then she cannot escape the real responsibility for that. Indeed, it is the whole history of Scottish education that any education minister in this parliament holds in sacred trust. The First Nation to invest in and legislate for universal education, universities ancient yet open to the fabled ladder parts, a system which prided itself on its breadth and its world-class quality. And like all of the best myths, these are part true and part false, but they point the way to our future aspirations as well as tell us about our past. And they were at least partly true. After all, the embodiment of Scotland's intellectual and cultural life, Burns, may have been the son of a tenant farmer and a sometime ploughboy, but he could read Latin and Greek and speak French too. The recent and worrying trends in our education system strike at the very heart of these historical and traditional strengths, and they are recent in origin. The evidence we have drawn to Parliament's attention with regard to the impact of the new national exams is exactly so worrying because it demonstrates a narrowing and a worsening of achievement at a crucial stage in our schools. The statistics show that an unintended consequence of the way in which a curriculum for excellence has been rolled out is that pupils sit fewer exams and are failing more of those they do sit. And the Minister's response has been to try and fail to trash the statistics or to point to progress made by pupils who have not sat the new exams or followed the new curriculum because it has only re just reached fifth year. And even then, it is the case that higher and advanced higher pass rates from last year had fallen as well. That ministerial complacency is reflected in the government motion, which is why we cannot support it this afternoon, though there is little else in it we would disagree with. Dr. Alstall. But for giving way, and I hope he won't view this as ministerial uh, complacency if I just point out to him that there is a record 
Now, there is a record number of provisional entries for the current hire diet, 201,000 compared to 191,000 in 2014. I really don't think that shows a, a curriculum which is failing young people. Alistair, uh, you agree? Well, let's see what happens when we get these results. But if we look at last year's pass rates for hire, they dropped from 79 to 77 per cent and in advanced hire from 84 per cent down to 81 per cent. And these are the very years which the Cabinet Secretary uh, made reference to. These are early warning signals that we present, as indeed is the Fruri over this year's new maths hire. And they cannot and should not be ignored. Has the Education Secretary spoken with the SQA about the higher maths problems? Has she asked for an investigation? Does she understand that scaling marks will not be an answer for any pupils who were too upset and there were some to complete the exam? We have already told the Cabinet Secretary the new appeal system is not fit for purpose and it is likely to be tested to destruction by this looming problem. But perhaps even more alarming is the evidence the Cabinet Secretary herself referred to of a sharp decline in standards in basic skills, literacy and numeracy. Scotland introduced universal education exactly to guarantee these skills for all and now standards are moving in the wrong direction. And the correlation between a child's family income and their success in reading, writing and counting remains stubbornly unmoved. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has said she will support what works, and any independent study is very welcome. But we do know much of what works already. Start early, get the basics right, work with parents as well as children, target resources not equally but for equality, support teachers and raise their professional standards, demand that everyone has the highest aspirations for the children they teach, and all of that is why we welcome the government's attainment challenge, but question how it is being deployed. The blunt instrument of targeting seven local authorities simply means that, for example, children and families in communities like Craig Miller or Wester Hales in this city will miss out altogether. Meanwhile, using resources to appoint advisors and authorities uh, rather than practitioners and communities cannot be the first priority. Mr. Constant. I just wanted to highlight to Mr Green, I think it is a matter of public record that the government has already said that we will start with the seven local authorities with the greatest proportion uh, of children from disadvantaged communities. But as we move forward, uh, we will certainly be looking at areas uh, where there are pockets uh, of deprivation uh, across the country and will indeed be given consideration uh, to challenge schools or challenge communities. Ian Gray. The problem with all of that is that the children we are talking about cannot wait. Their opportunities will have passed them by uh, by the time the government get round to doing that work. And yeah, you know, these attainment advisors we find now are secondments, which will presumably mean we identify those with the greatest knowledge and skill in overcoming educational barriers and then remove them from our schools for two years. All of this is why we have proposed doubling the resources devoted to the attainment gap and using those resources to employ more teachers, more classroom assistants to free teachers up and teams of literacy specialists in exactly those school clusters where the problem is sharpest and the biggest gains can be made most quickly. That's why we suggest that instead of taking teachers out of classrooms, we reintroduce and revamp the Charter Teacher Scheme to reward teachers for staying in the classroom, working at the hard end of the attainment gap and being rewarded for doing just that. The truth is, we will not reduce the attainment gap while cutting thousands of teachers, increasing class sizes and spreading resources ever thinner. And that's why we should commit now as a signal of intent that when we have the power to raise a top tax rate of 50p, we will do that and use the resource to raise the life chances of those children. Early intervention is the key. But it's not the only challenge. We are also the worst in the UK at getting students from poorer backgrounds into university. And I acknowledge the government's widening access commission, which is very welcome indeed. But look, again, we know some of what is wrong. When I was a teacher in Livingston, I remember I lost a whole higher physics class because Ferranti took on 100 apprentices. And every one of those pupils who went would have got the hires for university and would have succeeded there. But they left because Ferranti was offering them a job. They could see how they would live as well as learn for the next four years. 
So while I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's correction, cutting bursaries for poorer students, as this government has done, cannot encourage such students to take that leap to university. It needs to be reversed. And here's another thing. I bet that many of those pupils of mine going to Ferranti actually did end up with a degree at some point after their apprenticeship, after going to college, and perhaps then going on to university. So this is the other thing the Scottish Government have got spectacularly wrong. To close the attainment gap over people's lifetimes, they need second chances as well. 140,000 students have gone from our colleges, and they are exactly the part-time students studying while they're in a job, second-chance learners who missed out first time round, women returning to work, and those trying to get the hires they fail to get for whatever reason at school. These are exactly the opportunities which have gone. Now, Ms Constance styles herself Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. The truth is, she should change her title, or better, change her government's policy on colleges, because the truth is, lifelong learning looks like it is a long way towards going. Look, we all have a sacred responsibility to ensure that no child, no young person in Scotland is left behind and that every one of them has the best possible chance in life. And that's exactly why we will continue to hold this government to account for its failings over the past eight years and always press it now for action in the future rather than just words. Many thanks. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 13246.1. Smith, six minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I move the uh, amendment in my name and can I also say that we will be uh, supporting the Labour Amendment and also the Liberal Amendment. I think uh, the Scottish Government uh, has chosen a very interesting uh, topic because I think equity and excellence are two uh, extremely important things. And I note that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has asked us to accept the definitions of both that she produced in her uh, Glasgow University Robert Owen Centre lecture. When it comes to the definition of equity, I think the Cabinet Secretary says that it's about ensuring that every child has the chance to succeed. And when it comes to excellence, it's about ensuring that every child has the best possible learning experience at all ages and stages of education. And I think that's absolutely right. The question, of course, is how we go about that. Before we debate this just a little bit more fully, I think it's uh, useful to look at what the Royal Society of Edinburgh's response to the new education bill has been. And it says very clearly that there is a very important difference between the terms equity and equality, a difference which matters greatly, not just in terms of the loose language that has been used in the bill to date, but in terms of what the desirable and achievable outcome is given the changes that are taking place in Scottish education. The Royal Society, I think, is absolutely correct when it makes that distinction and it, when it puts the emphasis on the need for greater equity, ensuring that every child has the chance to succeed, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly says. Not only is that much more practical and educationally the right thing to do, it's actually in line with what is happening in Scottish education. Radical change is coming whether the politicians like it or not, and there are two drivers for that. Firstly, the changes that are taking place in further and in higher education which reflect a very fast-changing world of employment, and secondly, the fact that the current comprehensive system of schooling is not making sufficient progress when it comes to improving literacy and numeracy or closing the attainment gap. As a result, our foremost educational thinkers have challenged what has become a consensus in Scottish that the Scottish school system is fully fit for purpose and that the curriculum for excellence will be the panacea that we all crave. Secondly, they have questioned the wisdom of adopting a philosophy which treats equity as the same thing as equality and a system that is built to offer uniformity across the board. And that's all at the same time as Sir Ian Wood has made plain the need for a much more diverse form of schooling which responds to the different needs of the economy and the desire amongst a growing number of parents that there has to be greater responsiveness to what is happening in our schools. Now, that does not mean the wholesale dismantling of the school structure. That would be both unacceptable and unwise, not to say very expensive. But there has to be a degree of reform which allows the weaker performing parts of the system to match the stronger performing parts. And I have sympathy uh, with the Liberal Democrat uh, motion on um, pupil premiums in this. Uh, and where the expertise of teachers and the talents of pupils and the wishes of parents 
can all be much better aligned and free, perhaps, from political interference. Messrs Bloomer, Donaldson, Patterson, Cameron, they've all had very important things to say in this regard at a time when the monopoly of COSLA has been broken and there is much discussion in the reform of local authorities. I believe that there is real scope for change. That means challenging whether catchments are really the best means of deciding where pupils go to school. It means allowing new or different types of school to start up, if that's what parents want. And it means uh, ensuring that there is a particularly relevant and appropriate criteria that is set when it comes to all the work that is done so well by HMIE and the Care Commission. It means questioning whether we know as comprehensive education really fits with the ethos of the curriculum for excellence and the very extensive changes that are taking place in higher and further education. It seems to me most unfortunate when many people criticise... Yes, of course. Alistair. I have to ask this. The member has mentioned a couple of times about comprehensive education, and I may be misinterpreting her tone, but can I just clarify that the member is in favour of Scotland having a comprehensive education system? Smith. Up to a certain age, I am, but not uh, in the question of S1 and S2, where I think that we have run into difficulties about the S1 and S2 curriculum. And I think if we look at how we are uh, measuring up for the uh, future phases of the curriculum for elections, we've got severe problems if we're going to allow the S1 and S2 curriculum uh, to be uh, as diverse as it is, which I think is one of the reasons that we're having struggle uh, with literacy and numeracy. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary was quite right when she addressed her issue uh, about why there is a deterioration in the standards of literacy and numeracy between primary school uh, and the early years of secondary school. And that, and that's something that Keir Bloomer has reflected on, uh, is uh, a very important point. So I'm not in favour of comprehensive, uh, comprehensive education right throughout the school. And I think one of the things that we'll find is that the, with the way that the world is changing uh, agrees with that uh, point. Now, can I just finish my remarks about excellence? Because I think excellence uh, is, is just as important. There was a very uh, interesting paper produced by Lindsay Patterson uh, in Edinburgh University uh, two years ago, where he said that Scottish education has rather neglected the outstanding students. Uh, in the interest of public accountability, he said, it has ne neglected the diverse, imaginative and controversial ideas which might be provoked by some diverse sources of finance. And I think that's important, just to take up the point that Ian Gray made about the history of Scottish education. We have a very proud history uh, in this country of being able to ensure that that philanthropy benefits everyone, no matter what their background is. And I hope the Scottish Government uh, will address that uh, as they look to see what we can do uh, to in inculcate a, a real spirit of excellence. Excellence demands, I think, a free, a free thinking and I hope the government can give uh, very careful uh, thoughts as to how it might progress, given that educational policy from this Scottish government at the moment tends to be very centralised and dependent upon the government taking very much more control uh, over educational institutions than they do themselves. So I'm happy to conclude on that basis. I think it's an interesting debate about equity and excellence, uh, but I think it does require uh, a spirit of free thinking, and I would urge the government to think further about that. Many thanks. I now call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move Amendment 13246.3. Mr MacArthur, six minutes thereby. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Uh, I appreciate this debate falls hot on the heels of a very similar one uh, last week, but that is perhaps no bad thing, given the importance of the issue of attainment, the lack of progress we have seen in closing the gap for those from more disadvantaged backgrounds and a range of other indicators that illustrate the Scottish Government has rather taken its eye off the ball. Like others, I welcome some of the statements made by the Cabinet Secretary and indeed the First Minister over the last few days, but their call for a fresh start on education do rather serve to underscore the failure of the Government to get to grips with these issues over the last eight years in office. And while this debate, I think, will only serve a useful purpose uh, if we focus on where we go from here, I don't think it's unreasonable at the same time to reflect on the SNP's record in government, both good and bad, and that appeared to be acknowledged and accepted by Angela Constance in what I thought were generally measured opening remarks. Uh, for example, as my colleague Willie Rennie pointed out in the debate last week, and as Ian Gray highlights in his amendment, since 2007, teacher numbers have fallen by well over 4,000. The average class size for P1 to 3 is not the 18 promised by the SNP eight years ago, but closer to 23. 
Meanwhile, PISA studies, uh, scores for maths have gone backwards in 2009 and 12, while the latest Scottish survey of literacy and numeracy makes for uh, disappointing reading. Uh, as EIS support um, suggests, turning around and blaming teachers, given the drop in their numbers, the increase in pupil ratios, and the ballooning of workload pressures, it's hardly an appropriate response for the Cabinet Secretary. All the more so, as over the last eight years, any of us raising concerns were told by SNP ministers that we were wrong, that everything was fine, and irony of ironies, we were all guilty of talking down Scotland's teacher. That was never the case, and perhaps now that ministers appear prepared for a fresh start, we can have a serious debate with the frankness alluded to by Angela Constance earlier about the improvements that are needed and where and how resources can be effectively targeted. In 2007, when the SNP came into office, the OECD made it abundantly clear that the major challenge for Scottish schools and our education system as a whole was the need to close the achievement gap for children from poorer backgrounds. Quite apart from the damaging effect this gap has on the individuals themselves and the lack of opportunity they have to fulfil their own potential, all the evidence shows that this has a debilitating effect on wider society and the economy. This is not someone else's problem. It affects us all. Ms Constance can quite reasonably argue that closing the attainment gap is not a new challenge. The concern, however, is that over the last eight years we appear to be moving in the wrong direction in too many areas, often because of steps taken or not taken by this government. I will return later to some of those decisions relating to colleges and universities referred to in my amendment. But let me first start with the crucial early years. No one now seriously disputes that investment and intervention in the earliest years bears the greatest return. Professor James Heckman and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, amongst others, have shown how the gap between those from poorer backgrounds and their more affluent peers invariably begins to open up well before school age and thereafter grows wider and more difficult to address. Yet evidence from the uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation also shows that there is nothing inevitable about the link between poverty and poor uh, attainment, as the Cabinet Secretary herself underscored. The EPI project makes clear that access to high quality early learning and childcare support before the age of three can help children develop their communication, language and literacy skills, as well as their reasoning, thinking and math skills. That is why Liberal Democrats have attached such a high priority to ensuring that this is made available to those who need it most. I'm pleased, as I've said on many times previously, that the SNP dropped their initial opposition to do more in extending such provision. But the 27% of poorest two-year-olds who will benefit this year still falls well short of the 40% of their peers who have been benefiting for a couple of years south of the border. There is a need for greater ambition from the government, ambition that can be achieved with the powers we already have. In terms of ambition, the establishment of the, uh, the Attainment Challenge Funds is welcome, and I think Angela Constance is to be congratulated on this. But while the principle is sound and de deserves support, I, like Ian Gray, have grave misgivings about an approach that targets areas of deprivation rather than individuals from deprived backgrounds. Those of us representing any of the 25 local authority areas in Scotland who stand to be excluded at this stage from the £100 million fund will be able to point to any number of children, young people and families that are as deserving of support as those from the seven council areas selected by ministers. I appreciate there are specific challenges facing those communities with the highest levels of deprivation and I do not seek to diminish those at all. But nor should ministers overlook the difficulties of those living in poverty amid plenty. Moreover, I understand that the government's targeting um, by area risks excluding well over 60% of those living in greatest poverty. When pressed on this at FMQs last week, the First Minister appeared to concede that she may look again at this area-based approach, and Angela Constance in her earlier remarks suggested the Scottish Government may look to go further. But in what timescale and with what budget remains clear? I hope that this happens and that we can see support targeted at those individuals who need it most wherever they live in Scotland. That is the principle underlining the pupil premium introduced by the previous uh, coalition government, thanks to the Liberal Democrats. Backed by two and a half billion pounds of funding, the pupil premium has enabled tailored support to be provided where and how it is needed, whether in terms of additional tuition, education materials, or work to involve parents in their child's learning. As well as targeting substantial resources that individuals in need, whether through poverty or for any other reason, this approach has also enabled banks of best practice and banks of resources for teachers and schools to be developed. Are there things that could be done to improve the, the, the pupil premium? Without doubt. Would its introduction in Scotland require adaptation? Almost certainly. 
but does it offer a more sensible approach to using the resources available than one that is inevitably more indiscriminate? I think most people would agree that it does. Deputy Presiding Officer, given the time available, I will return in my closing remarks to the issues in the Government's approach to colleges and universities, which seem to go against the grain of what we are seeking to achieve with regard to equity and excellence. For now, however, I would urge member, ministers to show more ambition on early learning and childcare and more of an open mind with regard to the pupil premium and targeting what resources are available at individuals and not simply postcodes in need. And I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. Uh, before we move to open debate, I just let the Chamber know we're pretty well on time today, so six minute speeches. Uh, Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful that we have the opportunity today to focus on the progress that has been made in our education system and to assess what challenges lie ahead for the Scottish Government in building on the success we have already achieved. I would argue that the importance of education transcends that of any other government portfolio that is debated in this chamber. The success of our education system is fundamental to how we create a successful economy, tackle poverty and create a society that serves all of its citizens. An education system that enables individuals to meet their own personal goals will ensure that we maximise the potential of the whole nation. A key indicator in judging the health of our education system is not only how well students can memorise certain information, but in how it empowers them with skills that they can use throughout their life to adapt and thrive in whatever environment they choose to go into. I am proud of what we have already achieved in this regard, and like the Cabinet Secretary, I am committed to an education system that is free and open to all, that recognises the needs of our children as individuals and values and invests in the vital work being undertaken by our teachers. I am particularly keen to ensure that we continue to develop an education system that gives our children the best possible start in life regardless of their background. I therefore very much welcome the Scottish Government's £100 million commitment to closing the attainment gap. And I believe that if we can implement this policy effectively, it will result in significant and long-term benefits. The principle of creating equality in our education system will help to break down the crippling barriers that people may experience due to poverty. Unfortunately, there are still too many people in Scotland, particularly children, who are held back by their economic circumstances. A report issued in October 2014 demonstrates clearly how this can be the case. The report outlined how just 3.9% of pupils from Scotland's most deprived areas managed to achieve three A grades in the higher exams, compared with 24.2% of those from the wealthy, wealthiest areas. Now, I am sure members from across the chamber will agree with me in saying that the issue of poverty is deeply ingrained within our society and has not been caused by a single government, nor can it be solved by the government working in isolation. We all have a responsibility to tackle the problem of poverty and in creating a more equal education system, we can transform individual lives and generate benefits for the whole of society. Other members of the Education and Culture Committee will know that closing the attainment gap has been a major focus of our recent work. And I certainly look forward to the Cabinet Secretary giving evidence later in the year. This will be an opportunity for the Scottish Government to provide additional clarity about how we can tackle the attainment gap in the most effective way. Now, I firmly believe that the Scottish Government in partnership with organisations within our system, have already made significant progress on this issue. I note that in my own region, West College Scotland, delivered 45 per cent of its learning to students from some of the most deprived backgrounds in Scotland, more than any other college in 2013-14. This important work complements the successes the Scottish Government has already been able to achieve, namely the record drop of those leaving school with no qualifications record numbers of school leavers securing positive destinations and a record proportion of Scots from the most deprived areas entering higher education. It is not enough. We ha still have a long way to go, but we cannot ignore the successes that have been achieved. Scottish Government schemes such as Opportunities for All and the Modern Apprenticeship Programme have been particularly effective in achieving some of these results. The Scottish Government is also investing more in colleges than Labour ever did, reaching £526 million in 2015 and has surpassed its commitment to provide 116,000 FTE places, reaching over 119,000. Further, the Scotland Schools for the Future programme is investing £330 million that will allow dozens of schools across Scotland to be built or refurbished, including recently Crookford Primary School in Eastwood. Now, at this point, it is worth issuing an unequivocal reminder that, unlike the Labour Party and some others, the SNP will never allow front or back door tuition fees. We remain resolutely committed to an education system based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay. Yet, I, 
Certainly. Ms Smith. Uh, I accept the uh, member's point. Uh, where does equity come in when those who are from uh, England and foreign countries are paying fees, whereas those who are domiciled in Scotland and the EU are not? The, well, I'm, I'm, sorry that the, I'm sorry that Liz Smith has raised that issue. We are responsible for those who live and reside here in Scotland. We are not responsible for young people from around the world. And I think our responsibility should be for the, the young people of Scotland, and that is what the Scottish Government yeah. is doing. Yet I know that despite the Scottish Government's success, there are clearly many challenges that remain, remain in improving the education system. I regret that some will seek to paint an inaccurate picture of these challenges, and I believe that those that do so are doing a disservice to both teachers and pupils. The results contained within the 2014 Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy show one such example in which the Scottish Government can still do more. While the survey results were extremely disappointing, we should also keep a sense of perspective. Around 8 out of 10 pupils at all stages are still performing well or very well in reading and a number of programmes have been launched since the survey took place. The Scottish Attainment Challenge, Raising Attainment for All, Read Write Count Campaign and Primary One Literacy Assessment have all been recently introduced. In light of this, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that the Scottish Government will reflect on these results and redouble efforts to ensure we continue to give students the best possible start in life. And as an aside, I'm very pleased to see that Mary Scanlon is closely following my work and my FOIs. Presenting officer, I'd like to conclude by saying that it's clear there is much to be optimistic about in our education system. Scotland continues to enjoy a high quality system from primary school up to the further and higher education sectors. And there are many programmes currently in place that will deliver positive results for the future. We are, however, taking nothing for granted. And we must identify those aspects of the system where progress has not occurred at the necessary rate. We must use a rational, evidence-based approach to these we challenges. Close, and ultimately, we will give confidence to parents across Scotland that our education system is empowering children to reach their full potential. Yeah. Thanks. Now I call on Joanne Lamont to be followed by George Adam. Deputy Presiding Officer, and it's a privilege to add my reflections and observations to this debate. And perhaps I can just say to uh, Stuart Maxwell in opening, that education isn't simply about children, schools and teachers. It is a lifelong opportunity for people to learn. And it is critical to understand that we can close the attainment gap by supporting parents to learn as well as to supporting children. And I would hope perhaps we um, could start with two quotes which I would like to think could frame this debate. The first is a Japanese proverb, vision without action is a daydream. The other from an American senator is perhaps a little more sharply put, don't tell me what you care about, show me your budget. So yes, we should have the optimism to see the power of education, a vision of opportunity for all with a focus on the least well served by the current system. But we also need the rigour and focus of a plan, with people across education and beyond clear about the scale of the challenge and their role. And I welcome um, all of the initiatives that the, the Cabinet Secretary has identified. But it is critical that that plan follows the vision. And yes, we should care. But caring will only make us feel better if it's not supported by resources properly directed. It may about, be about increasing resources through the imaginative use of the taxation system or challenging our own spending priorities in terms of our own claims to equity and equality. Now, I taught for 20 years, longer than I have been in this place, and for only two years of that time did I teach under a Labour government, and yes, it did make a difference. But yet, even in those years where there was a Tory government, there was amazing initiatives taking place, particularly because the role of local government at that time saw itself as a dented shield against attacks from a Tory government. We saw areas of priority treatment. We saw early intervention, looking at early years, initiatives that stand the test of time now and did make a difference in those toughest of times. So yes, of course, we must, we can and should talk about the impact of Tory policy on the capacity of this place to deliver a fairer education system. But we can't stop there. In these times, it is even more important we adapt the notion of the dented shield, that we protect our poorest and more vulnerable, and we defend the basic values of an education system that will deliver for all. And that should mean that nothing is off the table. I believe the Cabinet Secretary when she says that, but it would appear 
that her own backbenchers haven't got that message yet. It must be that everything is tested against the evidence and not assertion. It must be about mitigating the impact of a Tory government or of poverty or disadvantage, not amplifying it. And we should test these choices and justify them. The funding currently of higher education, should it be funded at the expense of further education as it currently is? Do we have the right funding regime in place if the poorest children, the poorest young people from the poorest backgrounds have support which is less than the whole of the rest of the United Kingdom? Should it be that a concern for us that we have the highest dropout rates across Scotland? Is it right to prioritise 16 to 19 year olds in a further education system at the expense of part-time students, those with caring responsibilities, very often women with children or caring for elderly people, the very ones who need training and support to access education. These are the ones we are not prioritising at this stage. And should we? have a system of regionalisation of a further education sector, which in reality defines cuts as savings with a consequence for students across the FE sector. The I'm grateful to, to Ms Lamont. I just wanted to draw to our attention um, that the number of full-time students over 25 has actually increased by 25%. And the number of women studying full-time courses has increased by 15%. And, of course, the point she makes about part-time provision is important. And we have invested uh, £6.5 million additional for part-time provision, which is important uh, to some women. Well, the reality well, is well. the FE sector has been cut and cut and cut again, and we know that. And you may be able to justify it. But you need to justify it rather than simply allowing it to continue in the way that it does. And can we justify choices in and control of local government funding by this government if it is having direct and long-term impact on the way in which education is delivered within our communities? And by that I mean particularly, yes, we understand the importance of teachers, but the reality, education is delivered in our communities, not just by teachers, but the support staff that go alongside them. And I do urge the Cabinet Secretary Pickler to give attention to this. Support staff who will support children in episodes in their lives, whether it is a bereavement or a breakup in the family or some um, challenges. Attendance officers who are able to identify young people who may be in danger of dropping out of the system. And I fear there are young people now dropping out in second and third year who are not being picked up in the way that they might have done in the past. Classroom assistants, personal assistants who support young people to achieve their potential in education. Teachers do matter, but these other supports are absolutely critical if we're going to ensure that children are able to sustain an education. I was surprised when I raised this question with the Minister uh, um, General Questions that would appear the government neither knows the levels of support assistance available in our schools, never mind identifying standards that would be reasonable to accept. Um, in the time that I have left, can I just urge Small the Cabinet Secretary to be true to her word that nothing is off the table and that we can work together in the reality of what's happening in our schools, in our colleges and our universities to ensure that what we all aspire to, which is a hope that education gives to all families right across Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on George Adam to be followed by Willie Coffey. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to speak in this debate also, mainly because I believe that no child should be born to fail. And that's probably the most important thing I'll probably say all afternoon. Because uh, recently, obviously, with the bank holiday weekend, I visited my five and a half month old granddaughter Daisy and like every other grandparent you have her on your knees and you think about what she can do with her life, what she can uh, achieve and also it's a very similar uh, discussion I had with my, I remember the day when my daughter was born in the RAH in Paisley and it was the same thing then, all parents want the very best for their children and that's one of the reasons why I think this attainment debate is one of the most important things we'll discuss. I've also mentioned about how we had a lost generation in other debates during the the Thatcher years, friends of mine who drifted away uh, effectively just became husks of themselves as instinctive survivalists as life made things extremely harsh.
harsh and difficult for them. And that's why this is so important to me. And that's why I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has made education and educational attainment its top priority. The First Minister recently said, I'm determined. Indeed, I have a sacred responsibility to make sure every young person in our land gets the same chance and I, I had to succeed at whatever they want to do in life. And for me, that's the most important part of this debate, because these opportunities are what's going to make the difference to our young people's futures. And since taking office in 2007, the Scottish Government has seen a return to free university education, free school meals for primary ones to threes, increased modern apprenticeship. So we have much to be proud of, but still too often children who grow up in deprived areas achieve lower attainment than those more affluent areas. And that's not just something that's happened overnight, that's something that's happened over decades, if not lifetimes. And in my own hometown of Paisley, I take no pleasure in saying that fewer children in an area like Fergusley will achieve positive learning outcomes and go on to positive destinations when leaving school than from another area like Ralston, only 10 minutes away, one in the east end of the town, one in the west end of of the town. The difference is that could be the difference between there might as well be another universe as far as, as far as many young people are concerned. But many of them of these young people will even attend the same high schools. But factors out with their control will dictate their educational achievements and therefore their life chances. As elected rep representatives, we have a duty to everyone in our towns to ensure that we are doing all we can for our children. And in Paisley, we have numerous groups helping to raise attainment and, and close the gap out with traditional educational uh, framework. As a member of the Education and Culture Committee, I've heard evidence from numerous people on how we close the attainment gap. Our, cur our committee is currently undertaking a year-long inquiry into educational attainment. And recently, and totally coincidentally, we heard from Brian Caldwell, Chief Executive of St Murn Football Club, and Stephen Gallagher, Manager of the Street Stuff Project, a local project run by St Mirren and the local authority, Police Scotland and Fire and Rescue Scotland. And it was really interesting to hear about the impact that Street Stuff has had in our uh, area. Not only has it been a way to stop antisocial behaviour throughout Paisley and Renfrewshire, it has been it's developed into a way for, to get young, hard-to-reach young people to ensure that they can work with them to uh, offer them something better in the future. Some have gone on to actually get uh, uh, better educational attainment at college places, and others have managed to find a way to get employment within the football club itself, which offers quite an opportunity for these young people as well. And I think this is one of the things when we're talking about attainment, we have to ask ourselves, what is the best way? Because we talk about hard-to-reach children and hard-to-reach parents. Well, I think the language is quite bad in itself. I think it would be better if we find ways to actually make sure we find a common goal and interest that both the parents and young people have. And I think projects like this one at St Murn is a perfect example of how we can use something that people want to do, whether it be the culture, whether it be sport, giving them an opportunity to access and see that there is something else to do because not every child that is born in an area like Fergusley Park believes they are born to fail. They actually are born like the rest of us with dreams and desires and hopes and wishes to do better in life. And I think it, we have to be upon ourselves to make sure that we can engage with these young people and their parents in particular to show them that there is a better way forward. But when we talk about attainment, what exactly do we mean? Is it a positive destination for that young person or is it a place in higher or further education? During the Education Committee's evidence into the inquiry into attainment, much has been said on this, and it appears that some schools are purely uh, focused on the academic and are not showing the leadership necessary to offer other careers for our young people. When asked, Phil Ford of Construction Industry Training Board said some schools measure success by the number of pupils who go to university. We need to challenge that and promote vocational careers as being equally valid. We had a similar debate last uh, week, uh, presiding officer, where we have to find a way where we can find a, a different stream for young people to be able to actually access that vocational uh, uh, future as well, because there seems to be too much of a reliance on us going down the academic side. Terry Lanigan, Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, says, I believe that vocational education is important to academic young people as it is to others. The skills that are developed through work-based learning are important to everyone in society. 
One of the challenges is to persuade Scottish society, particularly but not exclusively, parents to recognise the value of different routes to lifetime achievement. And I think this is an important part of the debate. So, in closing, presiding officer, I would say that uh, we rightly need to highlight the achievements that the government has already made so far and build upon these. But we have to ensure that no child is left behind and that no child in Scotland should be born to fail. Many thanks. Now call Willie Coffey to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have an opportunity to contribute to, to this important debate, to recognise the many achievements made collectively by the government, the profession and the thousands of pupils and students studying in Scotland today and to explore what exactly it is we want from our education system for our young people. I'm sure all of us want the same endpoint for our children, our students, to get the best education possible that will give them opportunities to work and earn a living, be a good citizen, and ultimately share their wisdom and experience for the greater good of society. We will probably argue about the best route we should take to get us there, but I hope we don't end up squabbling about the details of the route we choose and instead share some ideas and thoughts about the real purpose of education and the value of being educated in a country like Scotland with a long history of excellence and achievement. Looking at what has been achieved so far is certainly impressive by any standards. We do have record exam results. Higher passes are up. More pupils are leaving school with four, five and six hires. And that's the same for youngsters from our deprived communities too. We've got record numbers of school leavers in work, education or training. And the Accounts Commission reported that performance has improved against all 10 of the attainment measures they examined in the last decade, the majority of those coming in the last five years. And of course, we don't charge our students tuition fees when they go to university. All of these achievements are, are worthy of celebrating, but they're never enough, as many of the members have already said, and we should always strive to do better. The £100 million attainment challenge fund targeted at those communities who need help the most is a fantastic opportunity for schools and youngsters learning in challenging environments to really start realising their potential. It will focus on literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing in primary school. It will provide more teachers, resources and, importantly, I think, too, more opportunities for learning out with the school setting. Will it help to later close those attainment gaps our Education Committee is currently considering? Time will tell, and our colleagues on the committee will no doubt be looking very closely at this. There are some wonderful quotes around about education, and Joanne Lamont mentioned a few that are perhaps some of her favourites. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most important, the most powerful weapon that we have to change the world. Martin Luther King tells us its purpose is to teach us to think intensively and think critically. One of my particular favourites by none other than Malcolm Forbes said, the, pur the purpose of education is to replace an empty mind with an open one. And that really begins, I think, to point us in the direction of how we best develop the skills that enable young people to think critically, to challenge accepted wisdom and to open up new possibilities for themselves and the rest of society. When I think back to my own time at school, I can recall some of the pain of having to learn the next page of Latin verbs or to read the next 10 pages of a history book about the Tudors. For me, that, that wasn't education. That, that, that was no more than absorption of information and a test of my memory. And I think we might still be having a debate along similar lines today. University, though, was an incredible leap in complexity and challenges. And I'm so thankful now that, along with my computer science degree, I was required to study other areas. And I chose sociology and psychology. I learned about social and political systems, and I began to listen to others who thought differently about a lot of things. So my mind wasn't too cluttered with things like recursive algorithms or Turing's virtual state machines or solving mountains of differential equations. It was a reasonably balanced and widened out for me, and what a wonderful experience that was. My perhaps once empty mind was at last beginning to open too. I think, presiding officer, we owe a debt of gratitude to our colleagues on the Education Committee who are asking some fundamentally important questions, like what exactly do we mean by increasing attainment and closing attainment gaps? How do we measure the success of that? Are we still too fixated in passing exams? And what should the relationship be between schools, colleges and universities? 
And why are we still pushing our youngsters more towards university than to the colleges? Is it about numbers and getting more of one group through college or university to catch up with another group? These are crucial questions already being posed by stakeholders. So the committee is engaged in some crucial work that will hopefully take Scotland forward yet again to a new level of understanding about the role and the purpose of education. Presiding officer, in summary, I think Scotland does have a lot to be proud of in terms of the quality of education we offer our young people, the achievements they have made and the professionalism shown by our teachers and lecturers. Yes, I think it's right that we should also challenge and continue to improve and to offer our young people a pathway to critical thinking and informed learning. Making progress, progress on this and opening that doorway for all of our youngsters is a task I think we should all relish. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to have the opportunity to take part in today's debate on equity and excellence in education. Uh, there is nothing more important than ensuring that, we, that every child has the best possible start in life, that we develop the, the ambitions um, of all our young people. And I got involved in politics to fight for social justice, as I am sure many members did across the Chamber. And I believe that we will only ever achieve a fairer and more progressive Scotland, indeed a fairer and more progressive world if we ensure that life is fairer, better and more equal for every single child. The fact that right now in Scotland the lottery of birth, where a child is born and who their parents are has got more impact on their life chances than their ability, their efforts or their talents is simply unacceptable and I know that we recognise this across the Chamber. But what is even more unacceptable is the fact that the gap in attainment levels between children from the richest and poorest backgrounds in Scotland is continuing to grow. And there's a lot of stats out there on the impact of poverty and education. And I won't repeat them today, but the outcome is that tens of thousands of children in each of our communities right across Scotland are simply caught up in a cycle of disadvantage from which there is little prospect of escape. I want to live in a Scotland where every single child in every community has got the best possible start in life, where every single child has got the opportunity to fulfil their potential, where every single child has the support that they need to be all they can be. Um, and I was pleased that the Cabinet Secretary said in her speech at Glasgow University that she would be led by the evidence about what works when looking at ways to make improvements. And in this respect, I would like to highlight the success of Fife in bucking the national trend in both literacy and numeracy, in closing the attainment gap and in reducing educational inequality. Fife Council in the last few years has made closing the gap its absolute top priority. They have embraced a really radical approach which involved investing um, £7.8 million to create transformational change in the early years, based on early targeted intervention to ensure that every single child in Fife has the best possible start in life to reach the potential. And central to this approach has been the development of a nurturing school initiative aimed at making teaching in Fife schools as inclusive and supportive as possible for all our children. This has been backed up too by an additional £2.5 million investment to help break the cycle of disadvantage. An investment that has been targeted into the key areas which have, been pro given a, which have a proven positive effect on children's education. And this has included the introduction of an additional 51 classroom assistants in the schools in the areas where they need the most help. Fife has embraced a radical workshop for literacy and numeracy approach, which has transformed learning and teaching approaches in all primary schools and has now been rolled out in, into secondary schools too. Um, a Fife-wide team has been set up um, to develop professional learning for head teachers, teacher support staff, ensuring a consistent and effective approach to the teaching of literacy and numeracy in every Fife school. And improving outcomes in literacy and numeracy has been at the centre of all the school improvement plans in Fife over the past few years. These, these are plans that have been delivered much more intensively in the most disadvantaged communities, using the best, best evidence of what actually works. And the intervention is being continually tracked and monitored to ensure that it really is making a real difference to the social and educational experience of children and families. Central to the Fife approach is the recognition that resources need to go where they're needed most. And this means targeted work in schools, focusing on supporting children and young people who are looked after, who are not attending regularly, who have high levels of exclusions or who live in high uh, areas of deprivation. And it really is an approach that is delivering real results. Well, the recent literacy stats for Scotland made worrying reading for mums and dads across the country. In Fife, the results were good and they're improving. 
For all pupils in five, reading accuracy improved. Uh, reading comprehension showed a highly significant improvement. For pupils from the 20% most disadvantaged background, performance in reading accuracy is above the national average. And again, reading comprehension showed a highly significant improvement. And it's not just literacy levels that are rising. Fife is successfully starting to close the attainment gap too. The attainment gap for literacy at S4 closed by 5% last year in Fife, with a 10% improvement amongst children in the most deprived areas of Fife. So this really is an approach that works, and it's delivering real results for children in Fife. I think this is a huge credit to the uh, Labour-led administration, but also to the teaching staff and all the other partners that are involved in making Fife's approach a success. I have visited a number of schools in my constituency to see the work, uh, workshop for literacy approach work in practice and it really does engage and include every single child. It is certainly a departure from what we can remember from we were at school ourselves and it really does engage every single child capturing their imagination. Um, I hope therefore that the Cabinet Secretary will reflect on and learn from Fife's success and look at what can be achieved when new approaches are adopted and when ending the cycle of disadvantage is a top policy priority. It is also a lot closer to Scotland than Ontario is and I know that um, she is visiting Queen Anne High School in my constituency on Thursday so maybe an opportunity to catch up then. Um, President Officer, the Scottish Government's motion today quite rightly highlights the fact that while poverty can be a barrier to attainment, it should never be an excuse for failure. Education should always be a route out of poverty. It should enable every single child to reach the full potential. But right now, the fact is that too often our education system can reinforce inequality rather than unlock potential. We will only successfully close the gap if we recognise that measures to tackle the attainment gap go hand in hand with the determination to fight inequality and to end child poverty. That is why Scottish Labour have proposed using the powers we will soon have at Holyrood to redistribute wealth and to deliver extra resources to help the poorest children by using a 50 pence top rate of tax. Across Scotland, our schools and teachers are committed to tackling the impact of poverty on educational attainment, but they really do need the resources to make this happen. Um, I notice I'm running out of time, so um, I'll finish up here. But basically, I think we really need to make the attainment gap the absolute top priority of the Scottish Government. Ian Gray has already said we need action, not word. We owe it to our children to get this right, to ensure that every single child in Scotland can be the best they can be, and to ensure that Scotland really can be the best place to grow up. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Six minutes or thereby, please. Uh, presiding officer, it, it, it's interesting how things in the debate sort of echo, and Cara Hilton's just uh, mentioned Queen Anne School, which my mother started teaching at 85 years ago. Um, her first year's wages were £36, pounds, uh, which wasn't a great deal of money then and sounds even less now. Um, but, uh, presiding officer, we're a very different kind of parliament from uh, that which we see uh, down south. Most of us went to our local school. Uh, we've got some exposure to the subject that's actually under discussion, albeit that uh, given that uh, I left school in 1964, and I see others who may have left at a similar period, um, no, he's saying even earlier, um, we're probably significantly out of date. But having said that, uh, even then, there was change. In 1962, I was uh, the first fourth-year cohort uh, to sit ordinary grade exams. That was the year in which uh, they were introduced in fourth and fifth years, where previously had sat lower uh, grade exams uh, that complemented the highers. We were the first to sit uh, sta uh, ordinary grade. So there has been change in the system uh, for, for many, many years. We have talked uh, a bit in the debate, as we always will do in such debates, about money. And, of course, it is interesting that uh, the average spending per primary school pupil uh, in Scotland is nearly £400 higher than it is in England, and in secondary it is approaching £300 higher. Now, some of the reasons for that, of course, can be geographic, because our schools are a bit smaller and therefore the overheads are higher. Uh, but we have seen expenditure rise by about 4.5% uh, in, in, per secondary school uh, in education uh, when the SNP has been in government. So I don't think we should imagine that simply throwing more money and doing the same thing is likely to lead uh, to significantly different outcomes. Uh, the motions before us are interesting. The government uh, says there's much to be proud of in Scotland schools. Who could uh, disagree? 
The Labour Party welcome the Attainment Fund and Widening Access Commission, and that's good that they do so. And the Liberal Democrats uh, focus, uh, as Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer of the Government, uh, on very early uh, part of life. Um, I want to just talk about a few eclectic things uh, that matter uh, to me. Willie Coffey uh, talked derisively about Turing, but the Turing test is one of the most important tests in artificial intelligence, which, of course, the first book on artificial intelligence uh, was written here in Edinburgh in the 1970s, very early 70s. Uh, the Turing test uh, developed in 1950 by Alan uh, Turing. So I'm a great fan of Alan Turing and of many uh, other things. Uh, I uh, myself confess to currently being a student. I'm doing an online course to improve my genealogical skills, a hobby I've had for more than uh, 50 years at Strathclyde University. I don't visit it. I spend so many hours on a train each week. Uh, I can do my studying then and a few hours on a Saturday and a Sunday night uh, online. So the world of learning has dramatically changed. My lifelong learning is quite different from previous generations uh, might, uh, might have been. Now, as somebody who studied mathematics, I'm naturally interested in how we deal with numbers. I'm currently reading a book on quantum mechanics, um, seeping myself in Einstein, Dirac, Pauli, and uh, Schrodinger, and many other uh, great uh, luminaries of the 20th uh, century. Uh, I admire the work of many of the women in computing, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, who was probably the first computer programmer in the modern era, and of course Ada Lovelace, who was Byron's niece, who was the programmer uh, for Babbage in the 19th century. But why don't we look at Cabinet Secretary putting some money uh, aside for some relatively small scale but long run uh, tests of different approaches. I've raised before the Trachtenberg system of speed mathematics, which is a terrific system developed by a Jew in a concentration camp during the last war, uh, which enables children to develop their memory and to develop mental arithmetic skills. I myself have used it on one previous occasion to demonstrate that 2 to the power 40 is 10995116277776 which, of course, you can immediately work out is the square of 1048576. And, of course, the real point about that is if you add the digits in 1048576, uh, you find that the digits uh, add up, uh, when you keep adding them up, to 4. Multiply 4 by 4, as you multiply the big numbers together, you get 16. Add 1 and 6 together, you get 7. Add the digits of 10995116277776 together, and you end up with 7. In other words, it's not just about doing the arithmetic, it's about having checking systems. And in other countries, they use the Trachtenberg system uh, to good effect. I also look at the work of Tony Bazan and his mind mapping approach, his developed memory work. And I think equipping children with very specific skills in improving their memory uh, may be something that's worth doing. I echo what others have said. Diversity in education is well worth having. I was a very poor student at all stage of my educational career, but I feel I'm very much welcome from studying uh, maths, natural philosophy, chemistry, psychology, geology, logic and metaphysics, Fr French, Latin, English biology, uh, geography and history at various times. And I'm amazed how useful I find much of that to be. Presiding officer, it's a good, it's a timely debate the government accepts the nature of the challenge. I hope the government demonstrates that it is open to other ways forward and to diversity as we work our way towards new solutions for those most disadvantaged in our communities. Presiding officer. Many thanks. Now call on Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, presiding officer. Scottish education is in a very strong position at the moment. Not my words, but those of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland when they gave evidence to the Education and Culture Committee in September. They also highlighted that we are well placed to move forward, but that is not to ignore the major challenges that are ahead. And there's no doubt that challenges lie ahead, whether it's dealing with the UK austerity measures or closing the attainment gap. But we should also recognise what has been a 
achieved given that backdrop. At the same committee meeting, the General Teaching Council for Scotland stated, we are trying to deliver for the first time ever an ambitious curriculum programme that covers ages 3 to 18. That has never been done before in the history of Scottish education. Curriculum for Excellence encourages each child to be a successful learner, who is also a confident individual, a responsible citizen and an effective contributor. The success of Curriculum for Excellence is witnessed in inspections, audit reports and examination results, plus the proportion of school leavers staying in a positive destination of either work, training or education at over 92% is the highest level on record. Education Scotland stated back in September, we have seen a transformation in learning and teaching in Scottish schools. For example, 90% of secondary schools inspected have been found to have young people's motivation and engagement in learning as a key strength. The Accounts Commission report School Education, published in June 2014, performance has improved against all 10 of the attainment measures we examined over the last decade. And further on in the report, the vast majority of the improvements in attainment have been made in the past five years. Then there are exam results where they are at record levels with higher passes up 3% from 2013, with more pupils leaving school having gained three or more hires. The new national qualifications were successful this year, introduced with nearly 300,000 passes at either National 4 or National 5 levels. However, one of the biggest challenges still facing education is the closing of the achievement gap between those pupils from poorer families who are not perform performing as well as those pupils from advantaged backgrounds. But this is not a new problem, as the Royal Society of Edinburgh states in its written evidence for the Education Bill, over a period of at least 50 years, many of the most important initiatives taken in Scottish school education have been intended to improve outcomes for the disadvantaged. From the introduction of comprehensive secondary education in the 1960s to the initiatives of the present, this has been a consistent policy objective. Teachers and government at both national and local level have been committed to the same. In these circumstances, the rate of progress is all the more disappointing and demonstrates the intractability of the problem. Now, the Scottish Government has increased education spending by £208 million, with the average spend per primary school pupil 9% and secondary school pupil 12% higher than south of the border. 526 schools have been rebuilt or refurbished since 2007, and that is almost 200 higher than the previous eight years of the Labour Lib Dem administration. The education maintenance allowance has been retained, helping 35,000 young people from the least well-off families to stay in education by granting them £30 per week if they have 100% attendance. So in Scotland, we have improved the curriculum, increased education spending, refurbish schools and incentivise the less well-off pupils to stay at school. Yet the attainment gap still exists. Could it be because the Scottish Parliament does not at present have the power to tackle poverty? The Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland in their written evidence for the Bill stated it is important to consider that the proportion of time children spend in school means that social inequalities cannot be remedied by schools alone, nor solely within school hours. Save the Children's written evidence for the bill said there is a large and growing group of children who are socially and economically disadvantaged. At present, one in four children in Scotland experiences poverty. We are concerned that the number of children affected by poverty is expected to rise to one in three by 2020. This suggests the challenges we face to reduce inequality of outcomes will become even greater in coming years. And this is before the next round of cuts being imposed by the UK government, where they intend to cut welfare by a further £12 billion. 
It is unacceptable that, due to the decisions of the UK Government, children and families in Scotland are suffering when we are one of the richest countries in the developed world. The UK Government said that the, the UK Government, at the very least, should honour the spirit of the Smith Agreement and devolve meaningful powers over welfare and the minimum wage to the Scottish Parliament in order that we can start to tackle poverty and boost the closure of the attainment gap. If we can do that, then I would accept that what the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association stated back in September could be true for every pupil. This is a very exciting time in Scottish education, and I think that we have a very exciting future ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alec Riley to be followed by Chick Brody. President Officer, I, I would begin by um, wanting to associate myself with the comments of Willie Coffey. Earlier, I agreed uh, with the majority of what Willie said, but in particular, he congratulated all children, all pupils across Scotland in terms of where they're at in education and the successes that they're having, their parents um, and all those involved in schools, teachers and all the staff in schools. Uh, because I think it is important that we recognise that teachers and staff are working under a lot of pressure. Uh, I should say that one of my own daughters is, is a secondary school teacher and I know the amount of work that they do, not just in school, but in the evenings and the weekends. And that's true of the teaching profession right across Scotland, so we should recognise that. Um, education authorities and are under an immense amount of pressure. Um, but I believe that actually the more we can localise and take the powers down from central government into local education authorities and actually into the schools, into the classrooms, empowering parents as well, then the more successful, successful we will be. Um, Audit Scotland in the 2014 report point out that council spend on education has reduced, reduced by 5 per cent in real terms between 2010-11 and 2012-13. Um, and that has put a major pressure. I was looking at Fife's education budget, and I was, I was looking at um, their budget for 2009-10 up to 2012-13. It was the, the previous administration to the one that I was in that was a coalition between the Lib Dems and the SNP. But if you look at some of the, some of the cuts that they were making here, devolved school budgets over £2.5 million cut out them in 2010-13 in primary schools, that was. Support staff in primary schools being cut. Removal of free bottles of water to primary one. Withdraw swimming lessons, study support funding for primary schools. And you go through it and there's a last some 30 odd million pounds of cuts that was taken out of, out of that, that, um, that, those years for those schools. And you can see therefore the type of pressure that education authorities are in. I know that, that as a, a council leader previously, the uh, chief executive of the council and the director of the finance of the council was always keen to stress to me that education was not protected and the education budget was not protected and therefore had to have its share of the cuts. And we know that local government are facing some horrendous cuts. And I think if we're going to have this discussion and this debate, we need to be honest about the types of pressure that our education system is under. Um, I would not, for example, um, agree with Liz Smith on, on a, a lot of the points that she makes in terms of, of comprehensive education and where she would want to see that go. But what I do agree we are on is that, that we need to think out the box. I think Liz Smith talked about the spirit of free thinking, but we do need to be able to think out the box and look at education because the fact is that whilst, whilst we're doing the best we can, we have to do a lot better. Our education system in Scotland has to do a lot better if we are seriously going to reach the point where every child is able to reach their potential. And that's not just the kids that are getting few um, exam passes at the present time. It's also the kids that, that, that are doing well, but actually could be doing a lot better if they had more support there. So it's right across the education system in Scotland. We should be doing much better, and we need to do much better. As I said, in listening to Angela Constance, uh, what, what struck me is actually the lack of ambition. We talk about poverty, but the Scottish Government actually lacks an up-to-date anti-poverty strategy. 
And surely, surely, if we're going to tackle inequality and poverty, then it's not just going to be done through the school. Indeed, it cannot be done simply through the school and through the education system. It's got to be done through all aspects of Scottish life. And every bit of government in here and every bit of government running through into local government has got to be joined up to tackle poverty. I was thinking, as, as Angela Constance was speaking some years ago when I visited a home start um, project up in Benarte, which is, which is in my constituency, and the workers there were explaining to me that without their intervention and their support, there would be some kids still in nappies when they were going to the primary school. Now, that's social breakdown, it's family breakdown, there are the root causes of poverty and deprivation, and the impacts of poverty and deprivation need uh, an injection of support and cash, and need projects through the community planning partnerships um, to tackle inequality and poverty at that level. You can't simply say that the schools are able to do so. Cara Hilton spoke earlier um, about Fife, and you would expect me to um, endorse what she had to say. But I remember the time I visited Benarty Primary School, and the kids came through and gave me some toast and tea. It was in the morning, early morning meeting. And the head teacher explained to me that, that the teachers were going out and buying the bread and then making the tea and the kids were involved in it. And for some children, just getting a slice of toast and a cup of tea in the morning, the contribution that that was making to their education, because if they were sitting there in the school absolutely starving, then they were hardly likely to be focused on learning and education. And it struck me, and one of the things that we actually did in Fife at that time was we started to put pockets of money, small, small amounts of money, £10,000, into primary schools, those in the highest deprivation areas measured through free school meals. We started to put that money in so that the head teachers could use that money at the local level for them to decide how they would improve um, numeracy and literacy and tackle inequality. And at that level, it can make the difference. So actually, the more money and the more resources, and if you look at Fife, and I will send the Minister what was, what was done here, in Fife over the last number of years, we started to put more money and reverse some of those cuts and, 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 and classroom assistance and others, and put money and in investment into IT. I visited primary, uh, Cowanbeath Primary School just a number of weeks ago to look at what the investment had been, uh, that, that was put into IT had I'm achieved there. Close, and, and in that school, you had young children learning computers, talking a language that certainly I didn't know. The lessons are that we need to put more resources in. We need to recognise the issues that's there. We need to empower education authorities. And if we can do that, then we can move forward. Thank you very much. Chick Brodie to be followed by Colin Beatty. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's but uh, six days since we discussed a similar motion in but three months. Uh, also, since we debated an equally uh, similar motion, a motion then which uh, harnessed constructive and aligned opposition amendments. Now, I understand and indeed share uh, frustration, but we will, I believe, have improved outcomes. And we should pay attention to, those, uh, to the views of those uh, a bit more discerning uh, of this matter who recognise outcomes have improved in general. The Save the Children said on the 16th of February after our last motion just three months ago it welcomed cross-party focus on tackling the achievement gap uh, over recent months and are encouraged by a fresh leadership from the, uh, by the First Minister to put this challenge at the top of the agenda. And it is. Uh, Cross-party focus, agreement. Presiding officer, that closing the gap, the closing the gap, the, the attainment gap, is the number one education priority, which can only be buttressed by attending the greater priority of, of inequality, inequality of income, and of course inequality of opportunity, and tacking these two together. Now we can sit or stand here and throw numbers at each other, anchored by targets rather than improved outcomes. But let's try and command that Save the Children cross-party focus on outcomes. I have to say I'm somewhat bemused uh, by an amendment which calls for the more rigorous testing of literacy and numeracy, uh, presumably also 
that of primary school children. Yet goes on to say there has to be much more focus on tailoring the learning experience to the best educational interests of individual children. Is that one test for all primary school children or one test for each? I hear echoes of the 11 plus. We should be establishing a system, yes, and of course, literacy and numeracy must improve, but a system that prepares children for life, not for exams. As I say, we could trade numbers all day. We, on this side, could highlight more spending per pupil uh, here than elsewhere, or more expenditure on new schools and refurbished schools, and the opposition uh, will talk of literacy and numeracy uh, attainment or pupil-teacher ratios. Presiding officer, I believe in one thing, however. The Education Committee, involving nearly all of our parties, I believe will tackle head-on the issue on informed data constructively. And I predict we will get answers and will recommend serious proposed actions for the earliest implementation. Change is a constant. It's always there. Uh, in education, as in other areas, we face changes and indeed big challenges, like changes like falls in pupil numbers, changes to the curriculum agenda and infrastructure, challenges, as I said, of the iniquitous incomes and living inequalities, all of which, all of which have to be addressed. The issue of poverty, presiding officer, and inequality is an overarching and critical one on educational attainment. One, indeed, that is eating away at the fabric of our society and impacting children particularly. Even in those straitened circumstances, I add my commendations, as has been said before, Alec Rowley just mentioned, to the work that teachers do. However, there is, I believe, an incumbency on parents and the wider family, many of whom do accept their responsibilities, but some who can't or don't. On their responsibility for the children's progress and attainment. Now, three weeks ago, I uh, attended a meeting with a social house, housing programme that is being built in Spain, a programme which seeks the building of low-energy cost three-tier family homes where the grandparents uh, live on the ground floor, the parents on the middle floor, and the children on the top floor. But that family unit can't, of course, apply to all families, but it becomes, indeed, an integrated unit, not just for care, but for development of the children and the freeing up of employment opportunities for the parents and therefore an aggregate income for the uh, uh, family. Uh, one might even uh, call it the modern day Los Tenementes. Highlighting the curses of inequality and poverty uh, and the, these, the two headed attack on attainment is right. And we can expect rightly the opposition to pursue them. But these monsters will not be defeated by intense debate alone and not just in this chamber. I repeat, presiding officer, parents and the wider family must be helped to understand their role in the joint war on the attainment gap. And there's no shame for us in learning from others like the London Challenge. It's not the children that are the problem. What we need is local school high caliber le leaderships untrammeled by targets or paperwork, then changing the school ch cultures and the parents' role in that change of culture. Can we do it? Of course we can. I, for one, don't like sitting in the middle of any table, in, in the middle of any ratings, least of all in international education. And I am sure, like all of us in this chamber, will work to ensure that we become top of that table. Thank you. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Claire Baker. Presiding officer, I doubt there is anyone in the chamber today who would disagree that education provides the main route for anyone from any background to reach their full potential. And I believe the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to delivering an education system that this country can be proud of. We now have record exam results, with fewer pu pupils leaving school with no qualifications than when the SNP were first elected to government eight years ago. And pupils are leaving school not just with one, two or three hires, but with four, five, six or more hires. And these educational achievements, which we should remember are not solely down to the government, but also the effort of all stakeholders, including local authorities, parents and most crucially, pupils themselves, 
have fed into post-school results. And according to the National Statistics on Attainment and Leaver Destinations, the proportion of school leavers staying in a positive destination, whether that be work, training or education, reached 90% in March 2014, an increase over the previous record of 89.5% the year before. Now, Skills, Department, Skills Development Scotland have expanded on this, with their School Leaver Destination Return Statistics report noting that 92.3% of school leavers entered an initial positive destination in 2013-14, and that's a rise of 0.9% on the previous year. Meanwhile, the, the report also confirmed that the percentage of leavers reported as unemployed and seeking employment or training had fallen to 6.3% down from 7.1% the previous year, and the lowest this figure has been in the last decade. Now, these figures are a reflection that the Scottish Government's programme for education is bearing fruit, but there's no doubt that more can always be done, and we can't forget those that don't manage to go on to a positive destination, or those who don't leave school with enough qualifications to attend college or university. And the Government's initiatives have been a start, but we all know there is much more to do. And we're well aware that improvements in education need to start as soon as possible in the early years. And to that end, there's more hours of high-quality childcare than in any other part of the UK. And our time in, go our time in government has seen an increase in the annual funded entitlement of early learning and childcare to 600 hours. And that's the equivalent of a 45% increase in hours for three- and four-year-olds over the past eight years, which has helped 120,000 children a year and saved families a very much needed £707 per child per year. Now, going forward, the Government's 2016 manifesto will set out a plan to increase childcare provision by the end of the next Parliament from 16 hours a week to 30 hours a week, and will shortly receive the findings of Professor Iram Siraj, a leading childcare expert who was commissioned to conduct an independent review of the early learning and out-of-school care workforce. And I look forward to seeing Professor Siraj's findings and how that will feed into the government's education programme. It would also be remiss of me not to mention that the, school, the free school meals programme, which is benefiting an additional 135,000 pupils in primaries one to three, over and above the 35,000 pupils who are already entitled to free school meals. And the families of these pupils will now be saving at least £330 a year. And we know from the results of a similar pilot scheme in England that free meals have a positive impact on nutrition and health, with the increase in attainment strongest among pupils from less affluent families and amongst those with lower prior attainment. And I would like to mention at this point that the average spending per primary school pupil stands at a higher level in Scotland compared to England, 4,899 versus 4,500. And we need to ensure that once pupils reach secondary schools, that they'll have the support needed to attain the highest number of qualifications possible and the Scottish Government has certainly not been behind in this regard. As with spending on primary school pupils, the average spend on secondary school pupils is also higher than in England, standing at £6,738 compared to £6,700. Of course, work with local councils is fundamental to providing schools and pupils the tools they need to attain at the highest level. And the Education Scotland Bill places a statutory duty on both the Scottish Government and councils to reduce inequalities of outcomes in schools and includes a requirement for them to report on progress made in narrowing the attainment gap. John Fifes, the President of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, stated of the Bill's requirement for each local authority to create a Chief Education Officer post, I quote, that the action being taken by the Scottish Government to address the disparity in outcomes faced by pupils from disadvantaged communities is positive, as is their commitment to ensuring that each and every local authority has a chief education officer. And that officer will play a key role, ensuring that our approach to the delivery of education is built on a clear understanding of what works. And we look forward to working with ministers in Parliament as the bill has progressed." Unquote. But our job doesn't finish once Scotland's young people have left school and are making their first steps into their new lives. The newly established Commission on Widening Access met recently for the first time to examine how barriers to fair access can be broken. So a child born today, irrespective of background, has an equal chance of attending university. We have also legislated in the post-16 Education Scotland Act for statutory widening access agreements and, in fact, are the only country in the UK to do this so far. 
All of the reform actions should be put in the context of the severe cuts that Westminster has imposed and will be continuing to impose over the next Parliament. Welfare reforms are going to see an additional 100,000 Scottish children living in poverty by 2020. And I'm sure that no one here would consider that one in five children growing up in poverty is in any way acceptable. We've come far in eight years of SNP government, but there's more work to be done. And I believe the measures intended will help ensure Scotland has an education system of which we can justly be proud and which will provide our young people with the support they need to make the most of their lives, whatever their background. Thank you very much. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome this debate on educational attainment this afternoon. Um, over in recent years, we have seen considerable changes to teaching in Scottish schools through Curriculum for Excellence and more recently changes to the examination system. Uh, many of our young people do leave school with very good record of achievement, but too many have persistently underachieved and consistently the evidence points towards poverty being the main reason for this attainment gap. Um, children from low-income households continue to do worse at school than those from better-off homes. So how do we meet these challenges? Of course, tackling poverty is fundamental to this, but we also need education policies and priorities which recognise the challenges. And the evidence suggests that progress has been too slow. The priorities of this government's education policy have made little impact on these trends. By age five, the gap is between 10 and 13 months, by ages 12 to 14, pupils from better off backgrounds are more than twice as likely as those from the most deprived backgrounds to do well in numeracy. Um, Save the Children um, made a recently interesting comment saying, we have concerns that current approaches have so far been too focused on improving attainment for all children in Scotland. We question the benefit this has for the poorest children. So financial commitments, the recent commitments to attainment are very welcome, but we need to be very clear about where the money is going and what it is there to achieve. And at the end of school, the attainment gap between the richest and poorest young people is equivalent to around three A grades at higher level, a statistic that talks of limited opportunities, wasted talent and underachievement. And to change these statistics, we need to be focused, prioritise activity, properly evaluate and do what works. Um, early years, parental involvement, prioritising the learning needs of children who are living in poverty. Evidence suggests that these all make a difference, but we need robust evidence on what works. And Joseph Rowntree's Closing the Attainment Gap in Scottish Education report highlighted the lack of data, research and evaluation as a hindrance to making progress. So this is an area of education which needs additional investment and it must be targeted in the right areas. This is why, in the spirit of constructiveness, Labour is proposing to double the number of teaching assistants in every primary school associated with the 20 secondary schools where the attainment gap is most acute. We will look at the opportunities that will come from increased revenue raising powers for this Parliament to invest in these areas. This would be in addition to what's already been announced by the Scottish Government. And although the additional money that has been announced is targeted at attainment is welcome, I am disappointed by the initial allocation of the decision. Um, Fife is to receive no money or no support in this first tranche of funding. Um, Fife is Scotland's third biggest authority, and yes, it does have a very diverse population, but to allocate money purely on a local authority basis has meant that too many schools and communities where poverty impacts on the educational achievement of children and young people have missed out. It is less than 16 miles to drive from Methyl to St Andrews, but too often these two places are worlds apart and educational attainment is one of these areas. And yet because of their geography, Leavenmouth, which is one of the areas with the highest levels of deprivation in Scotland, never mind within Fife, is not yet to receive any additional support targeted at addressing educational attainment. Um, Fife has the third largest amount of children living in poverty in Scotland and the mythology that has been used so far has been used to allocate the resources as flawed and unfair. A mythology that fails to recognise the needs of areas like Leavenmouth is not good enough. We should be getting support to where it is needed most. And high schools in these areas are working very hard. They are acutely aware of the additional challenges their pupils face. And they do see the bigger picture, the importance of inclusivity and shared experience and learning. 
Um, I visited Kirkland High School in Leavenmouth for their end of show um, last summer. And they had been a school of ambition, a scheme that was dropped by the SNP government in 2007. And that additional investment at that time had enabled them to focus on drama, music and performance by improving their facilities and opportunities. The level of involvement in the arts is important to that school, um, to the pupils, to the parents, to their community. And to see the confidence, the teamwork, the ambition of these young people demonstrated to me how important arts in school is. Uh, meaningful engagement in the arts does support other academic learning. Uh, the Systema project in the Raplock and more recently Glasgow is an ambitious and intensive approach to raising attainment through artistic engagement. And projects like this help create the right environment for learning, for confidence, for well-being. Um, I was at Balwiri High School in Kirkcaldy um, earlier this year uh, with, with the Minister and um, we were there for a meeting of the Instrumental Music Expert Group. And there is evidence that learning music can have a positive impact on other learning, but schools often find this difficult to deliver and children whose parents can afford private tuition are getting the greater benefits. And then when we look at those who are reaching the attainment levels needed for art college acceptance or entry to the conservatoire, Increasingly, there are groups of young people for whom a career in the arts is just not possible because of a combination of financial constraints and the lack of opportunity. Um, James McAvoy recently stepped into the debate saying that while no one detracts from the talent and success of actors who are coming from more privileged backgrounds, we are really worried about a society that doesn't give opportunities to everybody from every walk of life to be able to get into the arts, and that is happening. Um, presiding officer, if we are not going to accept the current situation, we need to see change at all levels, government, local authorities and schools, and we need to see real investment into the areas where it is needed most. Thank you very much. I now call Richard Lyle to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, presiding officer. I want to begin this afternoon by saying loudly and clearly that Scotland's education system must be fair provide excellence to every child, irrespective of their background or circumstances. We must make sure that we provide the best possible chances for our children and young people to thrive and be the best that they can be. And that's why, President Officer, I am sure that this SNP Government will continue to take action. The Education Secretary, Angela Constance, already has made it clear in a recent speech at the University of Glasgow's Robert Owen Centre for Educational Change that nothing is off the table in developing evidence-based work to tackle education inequality. That's because there is no quick fix to this issue. It is a collective approach that we must take to tackle the attainment gap, starting with government, where measures such as the introduction of the National Improvement Framework, which follows best practice from high-performing systems around the world, and will be used to gather data that shows not only what is working in Scotland, but why, for whom, and in what circumstances. But there's also an important part for everyone to play, from teachers playing their part in raising attainment, including understanding more about how poverty affects children's lives, to a role that parents play in being involved and in interacting with their children and young people's education. An absolute essential to overcoming any barriers that our children and young people face. A aim of this government in relation to equality in education has been that a children born today, one of our most deprived communities, should by the time he or she leaves school have the same chance of going to university as a child born in one of our most affluent communities. It is on this that we across this chamber must surely agree, President Officer, that we believe that no child, no child should be born to fail and that every child, regardless of background or circumstances, shall have the same chance to fulfil his or her potential. This Government, I note, is taking action, President Officer, through initiatives like Raising Attainment for All Programmes. They are starting to make a positive impact, and should, we should be proud of what has been achieved. Yes, I will. Claire Baker. Could I have Claire Baker's microphone, please? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I've heard a lot of praise and support for Angela Constance this afternoon, which, um, which might fairly be merited. But given the SNP have been in government for the past eight years, would the member like to give an evaluation of Mike Russell's record to date? Richard Lyle. I had, uh, the same as I have great respect for Angela Constance, who I've known for years, 
I've known uh, Mike Russell for years and I also have great respect for him. And I agree that more needs to be done. Too many of our young people have life chances narrowed by circumstances out of their control. And we should do all that we can to make sure that that is not the case. I want to share a quote, President Officer, that states, and I'm sure many people remember this quote, I am determined, indeed I have a sacred responsibility, to make sure every young person in our land gets the same chance I had to succeed at whatever they want to do in life. That was the words of the leader of this SNP government, First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. With passion and determination, like the First Minister and Angela Conscience, we have the responsibility to make sure that children and the young people get the best chance of success. It is with this responsibility that I suggest that the Scottish Government is acting with the introduction of the Ed Education Scotland Bill, a bill that places a statutory duty on the Scottish Government and councils to reduce inequalities of outcomes in schools and will include a requirement for them to report on progress on narrowing the attainment gap. A bill that will support this Government's existing work to raise educational standards, to raise attainment for all Scottish children and underlines our expectations of local councils in the progress of addressing education inequality. And it also arrives with councils, and most of them are Labour councils, and I'd like to see what they're doing. Of course, all is not rosy in the garden, but there's so much to be proud of in Scotland. Education, and we should take the opportunity to celebrate the many successes of our children, young people and, of course, the role of our talented teachers. Under this SNP Government, through the hard work and talent of pupils and teachers, we have record exam results. The number of higher passes is up 3 per cent from 144,749 in 2013 to 148,684 in 2014. In that same year, we also saw the successful introduction of the new national qualifications with 173,648 passes at National 5 and 123,734 passes at National 4. And an area which is so important is that fewer pupils are leaving school with no qualifications now than was the case in 2007. More pupils are leaving school with not just one, two or three, but four, five, six or more hires. That's not just overall true overall, but it's also true for those in the most deprived parts of this country. National statistics on attainment, leaver de uh, designation published in 16 June show that proportion of school leavers staying at in a positive destination, work training or education after leaving school reached 90 per cent in March 2014. The highest level on record up from a previous best of 89.5 in March 2013. In closing, it is clear that this SNP Government stands ready to always champion the successes and achievements of Scotland's children, young people and teachers, but also to make improvements and change the picture, picture where needed. And that's what just we will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last open debate speaker before closing speeches is James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, a strong education is an essential cornerstone for any young person to begin building their life upon. The necessity for strong numeracy and literary skills are pre prevalent throughout everyday life. It is upon us to provide the children with access to the resources needed to foster these skills and to allow them to grow. It is essential that our education system is fair and operates at an unparalleled level of excellence for every child, regardless of their background. We need an education system which will not settle for good enough but aims to deliver a level of outstanding quality and equity in education that will apply to all children. The equity that we speak of is about ensuring that each and every child is given their best possible chance to succeed in school. The excellence we want to see come around is all about ensuring that children get the best possible learning experiences at all levels, at all stages and ages, and ensuring that we invest in teachers and other staff so that they have the skills, knowledge, competence and confidence they need to do their jobs to the best of their abilities. Parents, teachers, academics, locals and central government all owe it to the children of Scotland to rise to the challenge of inequalities that persist within our education system. No child should be born to fail. Every child should have the same chance to fulfil his or her potential. The determination to tackle educational inequality is at the heart of this SNP government. And despite what our political opponents try to claim, this government has accepted the problem still facing us. 
In a speech announcing the Scottish Attainment Challenge, the First Minister highlighted that school leavers from the most deprived 20 per cent of areas currently do only half as well as school leavers from the least deprived areas. In the most deprived 10 per cent of areas of Scotland, less than one young person in every three leaves school with at least one hire. This rises to four out of five in, all, in our most affluent areas. The Scottish Government established a commission on widening access, which met for the first time last month to help us to ensure that a child born today, irrespective of a background, should have an equal chance of attending university. It will identify the key barriers to fair access. We have already legislated in the post-16 Education Scotland Act for statutory widening access agreements, the only country in the UK to do this. UCAS stats show a higher percentage of 18-year-olds from disadvantaged areas being accepted to universities under the SNP, 6.4% in 2007 to 8.9% in 2013. At this point, I want to play the role of a proud grandfather. My uh, granddaughter comes from a very normal working class family. Her, her mum and dad work extremely hard to make sure that she can get what she needs to do uh, to study, to get to, into university. And she was fortunate enough last year to get the uh, requirements, the uh, five A's, band ones, he says, with a smile on his face, uh, to make sure that she was accepted for the university this year. Now, Abigail is going to that university. It's cost her parents a lot of money to make sure that she can get the study, she can get all the books, that she can get whatever she requires. But they would have struggled much, much more if they were then having to face paying for her university tuition fees. Now, I accept that there's costs and challenges with, with young people going to university, but that uh, not having to pay those university fees is a great load off their mind. And I'm sure in two years' time they'll be saying exactly the same thing when Mark follows in their footsteps. As the First Minister said, over the next months and years, making sure the Scottish education system becomes genuinely one of the best in the world will be a driving and defining priority of my government. This statement highlights how much our SNP Scottish Government is focused on working for the Scottish people, aiming to improve lives and give Scotland the future it deserves. Now, as an ex-Glasgow City Councillor and as a Glasgow MSP, attainment is the, the heart of what I want to see in uh, any Education Scotland Bill. Uh, and uh, that, the Education Scotland Bill, intrusion the 23rd of March, will place that statutory duty on the Scottish Government and councils to reduce inequalities of outcomes in schools and will include a requirement for them to report on progress and narrowing the attainment gap. The Bill will support the Government's existing work to raise educational standards and to raise attainment for all Scottish children and underlines our expectations of local councils in the process of addressing educational inequality. However, we will defend the achievements not just of the Government but of students, pupils and teachers across our country. We will also be open to where we need to do better. There is work to do in our education system and we make no bones about that. We will not allow any politician in any party to reduce the achievements of our pupils. As Richard Lyle just mentioned there, we have record exam results. Fewer pupils are leaving school with no qualifications in the 2007. And more pupils are leaving school with these high, more hires than they did then. National statistics on attainment and leave our destinations show that the proportion of school leavers staying in a positive destination, work, training or education after leaving school reached 90% in March 2014. This is the highest level in record, up from its previous best of 89.5 in March 2013. With such high levels of school leavers moving on to work, training or furthering their education, it allows for youth unemployment to remain low. In comparison to 20 other EU countries, only five come in lower than Scotland. It's important for this government to continue building upon, upon the groundwork we have laid down to before us with the Education Scotland Bill. With record exam results and a record number of school leavers finding work, training or education, it's clear that we're on the right pathway. Even though we still have more work to do to improve these numbers further, it's still refreshing to have seen such great progress made. Thank you. Many thanks. That then brings us to the closing speeches. And I call on Liam MacArthur, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I didn't participate in the debate last week. I, I'm not sure whether this reflects much of the, the, the tone and themes uh, from them, but I've certainly found it interesting. Uh, I think every speaker has tried to uh, rise to the challenge of coming up with an alternative to sacred uh, duty in terms of underscoring the importance of the issues we're discussing. I thought Stuart Maxwell did uh, a fair attempt with uh, describing education as the subject that transcends all other policy areas in, in the transformative effect that it has. But I think it was a, a point emphasised uh, by all speakers. I think 
uh, Willie Coffey, George Adam, Gordon MacDonald and I think all of the SNP backbenchers uh, rose to give support to the Cabinet Secretary in identifying those areas where progress has been made. And I think that was entirely uh, right and fair. I don't think any of us are trying to denigrate what is happening within our education system uh, or denying that achievements uh, have been made in a range of areas. Uh, but I think it is um, uh, incumbent on all of us to recognise where we are not coming up to the mark. And, and, and I think uh, that has been fairly articulated um, by many speakers this afternoon. Uh, I think there are figures, not just from the SSLN, uh, but from PISA as well, that indicate where uh, progress is not being uh, made. In fact, we're potentially going backwards, although I was interested in what Cara Hilton's uh, comments about Fife, which may suggest that there are regional variations even within that. I have to say that listening to Stuart Stevenson and his, dis his description of the Trachtenberg system it had me questioning my uh, numeracy skills, I think, quite profoundly. But the message about uh, pupils not lacking the potential, many are already showing how they can overcome the, the obstacles in front of them, again, was a theme picked up by a number of speakers. Uh, and the, the attitude I think we all have, or all should have, that no one is born to fail, that the efforts of staff should not go unremarked upon. I think Alex Rowley, Willie Coffey both drew attention to that. And again, another common theme, I think, was a broad welcome across the chamber for the um, statement by the Cabinet Secretary in a recent speech at Glasgow University uh, about a willingness to keep an open mind and a commitment not to take anything off the table, though in, um, in observing the contribution uh, or the exchange between Richard Lyle and Claire Baker, it was interesting to note whether if Mike Russell had done such a great job, it was necessary to have uh, such a profound fresh start at this point. At the outset of this debate, I set out the compelling case for greater ambition from the Scottish Government in relation to early learning and childcare. An individual's life chances are invariably shaped and determined in the earliest years, sometimes even before birth. Um, but nothing, as I say, should be preordained or inevitable. And as with any complex problem, closing the attainment gap does not lend itself to quick or easy solutions. Silver bu bullets uh, are unlikely to penetrate. But greater investment and extending more widely access to good quality early learning and childcare delivered by highly trained staff can and does go a long way to rebalancing the scales in favour of those from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Building on the laudable steps taken in the last 12 months, both for three- and four-year-olds, but crucially also for disadvantaged two-year-olds, it is now time for Scottish ministers to commit to going further. It is time to match the 40% provision for two-year-olds from the poorest backgrounds south of the border. On the pupil premium too, as I said before, there are lessons that can be learned from targeting support for individual children and young people where, when and how they need it. Unfortunately, as Claire Baker, Ian Gray and others have suggested, the area-based approach adopted by the Scottish Government in its otherwise welcome attainment challenge fund risks overlooking the needs of around two-thirds of poorest children in Scotland who happen to live outside the seven council areas selected. But while I think the case for early intervention is the most compelling of all, any debate about equity and excellence cannot ignore what is happening later on in the education system. Here again, aspects of the approach taken by the Scottish Government appear difficult to reconcile with its status commitment, stated commitment to equity and excellence. Cuts to college budgets, for example, have understandably attracted most of the attention and criticism. Between 2011-12 and 2013-14, there was a 12.3% real terms cut, resulting in a major reduction in staff numbers, but also a loss of around 130,000 places. Ministers have sought to dismiss these as hobby courses and unnecessary duplication, but this rather glosses over the real practical effect, which has been a loss of opportunities, particularly for women, older learners and those in need of additional support. Uh, implications, as Ian Gray said in his opening, for genuine lifelong learning, despite the stoical efforts of Stuart Stevenson to upgrade his genealogy skills. Meanwhile, according to Hesse statistics, participation rates at uh, university for young first, full-time first-degree entrants from the poorest families in Scotland are down by 1.2% since 2005-06, notwithstanding what Stuart Maxwell said. Yet, they have risen by 3.3% across the UK as a whole. Of course, ministers like to focus solely on the issue of fees, but this ignores the impact that their decisions to replace grants with loans have had, quite apart from how this squares with their 2007 promise to dump the debt. Joanne Lamont echoed comments made by the government's former head of higher education, Lucy Hunter, recently, who explained, for young students in full-time higher education in Scotland, the net effect of policy decisions over the decade to 2015-16 will be a resource transfer from low-income to high-income households. 
After a cut of £35 million last year, total spending on grants and bursaries is now barely half what it was in real terms when the SNP came into office. As the Financial Times pointed out recently, statements from Ms Sturgeon in 2006 show that she believed debt of more than £11,000 would, quote, impede access to education. However, the amount of debt many of the poorest Scottish students will graduate with today is now often double that. I recognise that small steps were taken by the Cabinet Secretary earlier this month, though not quite the £19,000 heralded in a parliamentary motion signed by 19 SNP MSPs last week. Let's only hope that no student rushed out on a spending spree in misplaced um, uh, anticipation of such a ministerial windfall. In terms of ensuring equity and the widest possible access for those from disadvantaged backgrounds, ministers need to take a fresh look at all of the costs associated with attending university. Deputy Presiding Officer, closing the attainment gap, achieving greater equity and delivering excellence will require more than ministerial statements and, as the RSE point out, perhaps in a warning to Richard Lyle and James Dornan, vague commitments written into legislation. It will require ministers to target their energy and resources at where the need is greatest from the earliest years and throughout the education journey. I have tried to offer some ideas about how this best can be done and hope the Cabinet Secretary is true to her word about having an open mind so that these can at least form a basis for the fresh start we are told is now underway. Thank you very much indeed and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we agree with much of the Government's motion and uh, particularly that there is much to be proud of in Scotland schools and that much more needs to be done to give every child the education to grasp opportunities in life and that all options should be considered. And I put on the record that we welcome the OECD report uh, due by the end of this year. Uh, but would also say that there is an evidential base uh, to do more work now. Uh, and can I just say, presiding officer, I trust that Angela Constance will be applying Stuart Stevenson's quantum theorem mathematics to attainment issues, and I look forward to her uh, making an announcement to this chamber, preferably in Latin or Greek, so that uh, Mr Stephen would appreciate that. And uh, I would also say my colleague here has some Latin. I think that may satisfy Mr Stevenson for one afternoon. Uh, but at this time, there is no independent evaluation of what is spent on education, what delivers an improved attainment and achievement. And to be fair, I think we're further forward than we were a month or a couple of months ago. Uh, and I think there's not, a, I can't speak for everyone, but we, we all want better attainment. We all want the equality gap to be narrowed. We may have different ideas about how to pursue it, but the ends in themselves is something that we certainly all want. But the fundamental issue is that we need a system which can identify when a child, a child, not an area, a child is struggling to keep pace with the rest of the class, whether this is in a single subject or all subjects or across subjects. And only when development needs are identified for that individual child can an appropriate and uniquely tailored level of support be given. Allocating resources to areas of greatest deprivation will help, but only if they're drilled down to find each and every child in need. Otherwise, the money will be lost in education departments who will only need to tell the Scottish Government every two years what efforts they've made to address poor attainment in our schools. And the areas of highest deprivation, I have to say, do not directly correlate to the areas of lowest attainment. So I think that's a point that's lost on many SNP speakers. And if I could give the example, Midlothian is the fifth lowest in Scotland in terms of achievement, but they get nothing. And Angus, who are ninth lowest in terms of achievement at level five, also get nothing. And last week and this week, the SNP speakers have focused totally almost on poverty and deprivation as the main issue determining attainment levels. And indeed, it is one issue, but one of many. And the Audit Scotland report last year confirmed that East Lothian and Inverclyde have almost identical levels of attainment, but widely different levels of deprivation. But Inverclyde will receive attainment funding, but East Lothian gets nothing. And yet they're 
achievement levels are identical, as this report says. And some schools, as Audit Scotland also say, achieve better attainment results than their levels of deprivation would indicate. So whilst deprivation is a factor, Audit Scotland identified two important factors in raising attainment as improving teacher quality and developing leadership, both of which are already being done by Glasgow City Council, who have invested in staff development, with 90 managers completing Aspiring Heads programme and over 100 teachers achieving the Harvard Leaders of Learning accreditation. So what happens to the child living in an area of medium to low deprivation, well, they get nothing. So we need a system, not for an area, but a system that identifies every child. Uh, between Glasgow's approach to leadership and development and East Renfrewshire's approach to testing every child to identify learning needs, the Scottish Government would do well to look at what is working in Scottish education, to look for the evaluation and understanding of the money spent and what is achieved in terms of attainment, to ensure that the 100 million does do what we all want it to do. And I would also hope that some resources will go into preschool education to ensure that children start school with the appropriate support provided. I think most of the speeches today is about, uh, have been about what happens in school, but I think we need to look at preschool as well. But with the percentage of uh, pupils achieving five awards at level five, at 30% in Dundee, Clarkmanninshire and Glasgow, and over 70% in East Renfrewshire, East Dumbarton, Shetland and Perth and Kinross, there is no doubting where some of the hard work needs to start. The Royal Society of Edinburgh confirms that there's no national assessment data and also that state that the Scottish Government's strategic approach is seriously unclear for the future bill to address attainment. Uh, so I'm going my remaining seconds. We do have from Sue Ellis, uh, University of Strathclyde, uh, we do have four proposals Fairly simple. The GTC, to look at whether sufficient weight has been given to literacy, I mentioned earlier. Secondly, Education Scotland, looking at linguistic analysis and teaching uh, again. Thirdly, a new understanding of the usefulness of data in schools. And finally, uh, the Scottish Government should encourage schools to create positive cultures for data use with free national available tests, standardised where uh, appropriate. So testing is the answer. It has to be done in order to identify that individual child who needs support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mark Griffin. Nine minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Addressing the attainment gap in our schools is um, one of our top priorities and we welcomed the Scottish Government's recently announced plans to try and tackle it after eight years in government. Ed educational inequality is a symptom of a deeper problem of poverty which we need to address and so the, the focused nature of any programme is vital rather than that area based approach um, as raised by Liam MacArthur. In the debate uh, last week I uh, talked about this situation in Cumminald where the variation in educational attainment is massive and the Council Ward of Cumminald North the child poverty level is 8% which is too high but when you cross over the footbridge across the M80 into Cumminald South a two minute walk child poverty trebles to a staggering 23% uh, that's exactly the same different universe that George Adam mentioned um, with East and West Paisley, except this is just a, a two-minute walk across a motorway. Mr Griffin, uh, could I ask you if you could pull your microphone slightly towards you? I've got a bit of an echo. Thank you. Uh, that difference in child poverty impacts on the educational attainment of young people, which can stop them breaking out of that vicious cycle of poverty. So the measures that we agree to tackle attainment and the equity gap must be focused on our most deprived communities 
as a result. And I think the examples from Fife given by Cara Hilton and Alex Rowley um, show that that targeted approach really sees results. Now, with that in mind, um, we would use the additional revenues from a new 50p tax rate um, redistributing resources from those who can afford it to those who need it most to invest an additional £25 million per year over and above the government's proposals to tackle educational disadvantage. We have doubled the number of teaching assistants in every primary school associated with the 20 secondary schools facing the greatest challenges of deprivation. We have supported provision of high quality wraparound care for primary school pupils, like the provision of breakfast clubs and homework clubs to give pupils a productive start and end to the school day, extending the ability of education to break people out of that cycle of poverty. The issues raised by Gordon MacDonald, where he said the, the approach of education alone isn't enough, but if we education, in, extend the impact of that education to those wrapper, wraparound provisions, then it can make a, a bigger difference. We would also introduce a new literacy programme for schools and recruit and train literacy specialists to support pupils in the associated primary schools and first and second year pupils in the 20 secondary schools in those areas of highest deprivation. And as raised by Joanne Lamont, Chick Brody, the intervention and support of parents in their child's education can't be underestimated. That's why we would also offer support to parents so that they can learn with their children and would also introduce a special literacy support programme for looked after children. I, think I would support the, the point that Mary Scannon raised as well, where we would ask Education Scotland to carry out an annual review on progress to tackling the educational inequality in Scotland through the Schools Inspectorate programme rather than that two yearly assessment. I think we would look for that uh, report to include a specific section on looked after children and the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning also to report to Parliament on that progress being made annually to um, reduce the, the attainment gap and allow that progress to be monitored and scrutinised by Parliament. Now, it's been raised in a, a wider context um, about um, the contribution that science, computer science, maths um, and those key subjects um, can make uh, to the economy. And that's what we forget when we're talking about the, the abstract of an attainment gap or equity in education is that it's actually these highly skilled positions that we need to be um, skilling our young people to then go on and enter the jobs market. And there is an expectation that by 2030 in the UK over 7 million jobs will depend on science skills. Those science roles are exactly what we need. High quality, highly skilled, highly paid jobs, which other economies would struggle to compete with us for. Now, uh, the yep, certainly. Claire Baker. Um, I was wondering if Mark Griffin would agree that it's not just it's STEM subjects, maybe it's also STEAM subjects and the importance that the arts play in making sure we have uh, fully rounded people going into the workforce. Mark Griffin. Yeah, I, I would uh, totally agree with that. I think um, the contribution the arts make, um, certainly to my own field of study in engineering, it was certainly clear the, the creative skills that were brought to bear at university with those who had studied in those fields in terms of um, design and um, invention um, by people from, from those backgrounds. But um, the point I was uh, about to make was that um, by 2030, um, when those jobs will be available, that the four and five year olds who are starting primary school this summer will already be in work or possibly the final years of study. And if current spending levels continue, the same pupils with the same academic ability, the same aptitude for science in England will have enjoyed over 10 years of state education um, with 80% more in primary school and 27% more in secondary school spent on science equipment, according to a, a recently published report from the Learned Societies Group. And they also 
flagged up the issue of 98% of Scottish schools depending on external funding for science equipment, which has a bigger impact on our deprived communities where the parents will struggle to make a contribution to their children's education. They'll struggle much, much more than those affluent communities. And I think when the issue of science equipment, we've already spoken about that in Parliament, but the issue was raised uh, by Joanne Lamont around technicians, school support staff, and um, staff in schools other than teachers. And I recently had an FOI request um, to all 32 local authorities on science technician and science support staff. And there have been an overall drop in the numbers of science technicians in one authority cutting staff by over 50%. And those are the, the staff who maintain and repair equipment who give advice beyond the capability of the teacher. And those are the kind of skills that focused in the, the right areas could be equipping um, and bridging that, that gap for pupils in our most deprived communities. Now, I've raised that as well in the chamber um, in relation to, to computer science. Um, that, um, again, as a result of the cuts, we've seen computer science uh, teacher numbers falling, and there's been a, a disparity um, around how computing science teachers are identified and how we're able to, to tackle that to, to give pupils in our most deprived communities the opportunities to um, bridge that attainment gap right across the field to, to enter those um, highly paid and lucrative professions. Now, as I'd said already, we would use that additional revenue from a new 50p top rate of tax, redistributing resources from those who can afford it to those who need it most. We'd invest that additional £25 million per year over and above the government's proposals to tackle educational disadvantage and ensure that pupils who face the greatest educational challenges have the opportunity to achieve the qualifications that they need. Presiding officer, I'm glad that the government are making educational attainment a priority after eight years in government. I hope that they will look at the areas where our proposals can improve these plans by redistributing wealth and increasing the resources available. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Angela Constance to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by saying to Stuart Stevenson and Mary Scanlon that I think the days of learning your times table backwards in Latin has probably long gone. Um, but uh, my own seven-year-old uh, assures me that uh, mental maths uh, is alive and well in our primary schools. And touching on maths, I do want to make a, a serious point, I think it was raised by Mr Gray uh, and other members, that education ministers have indeed uh, discussed the concerns uh, of parents uh, and young people with uh, the SQA uh, regarding last week's maths and biology exams. And SQA has made a very public statement uh, and has assured us that it has robust regular procedures in place uh, to ensure that no candidate uh, is disadvantaged if an exam paper uh, turns out to be more uh, demanding than intended to be. <coughs> Certainly. Ian I, I very much appreciate her responding to one of the questions that I posed, but I did make the point that what SQA are saying there is that they employ proportionate marking, that they scale the results. But for those students who were so upset that they left early, that will not, in fact, uh, solve the problem. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and the SQA have uh, also confirmed to ministers that uh, they also consider um, it, where there has been evidence that if a question early uh, on in an exam paper has uh, put students off or caused um, distress and has you know, limited uh, their participation uh, in the, the rest uh, of the paper. Can I say... Just uh, maybe later, just to make a wee bit more uh, progress. Can I say, President Officer, I've enjoyed uh, today's debate and the, the many contributions, and I want to pay uh, tribute to uh, Cara Hilton because I do welcome uh, the positive developments that she's described uh, because they show what can be achieved uh, with focused local action backed up 
by the good use of, of data. And we'll certainly work um, with Fife and other councils uh, in developing uh, our national improvement uh, framework. And if I can also at this point uh, say to uh, Mary Scanlon, I'm very well aware of the work uh, undertaken by Professor Sue Ellis. And when I spoke at the Robert Owen Centre uh, last week, I agreed with her that we do need to have a, a debate uh, about the use of data that is proportionate and sensible and not an, a burden to either children uh, or to, to teachers. It is crucial that when we consider our education system that we do consider it in its entirety and most speakers uh, have done exactly that. Um, equity and excellence uh, has to start uh, in the early years and continue throughout schooling and onwards into vocational education and further in higher education also. And I do want to reassure uh, Liam MacArthur that we are most certainly not turning the clock back to, to year zero because under this government we have seen a massive expansion of early learning and childcare and we're not done yet. And we have also introduced or implemented the, the golden threads uh, of opportunities for all, pioneered, I have to say, by Michael Russell, the first country in these islands to introduce a guarantee to every 16 to 19 year old of a place in education or training. We also have Teaching Scotland's Future, Curriculum for Excellence, and crucially, uh, Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. Sorry, Liam MacArthur, please. Um, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Um, I, 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 as I said earlier, I think she's adopted a generally constructive approach to, to this debate, and I very much welcome that. In that spirit, would she be able to set out a, a likely time frame for increasing the opportunities for two-year-olds from those disadvantaged backgrounds, from the 27 per cent at the moment to the 40 per cent that we're seeing south of the border? Cabinet of course, um, Mr MacArthur will be well aware that we're just about to increase provision to uh, the 27 per cent most vulnerable uh, two-year-olds. I suppose I'm a little bit sceptical of the progress that has been made south of the border, uh, where um, recent surveys have shown that 40 per cent of councils uh, in England have struggled to deliver that 40 per cent uh, commitment. But this government has done more than any uh, previous administration uh, to massively expand uh, the early years. Uh, and we must also remember uh, that it is not just childcare, important though that is, this is childcare and uh, early learning. Presiding officer, what this government has done throughout its tenure is yes, we've had to make uh, very difficult decisions about reforming public services at a time of great financial pressure. And college reform has been challenging and it's not been without its controversies. But it has delivered more for those that are under 25 and over 25 years, as I hope I've demonstrated in my exchange uh, with Joanne Lamont earlier today. But where Joanne Lamont is right, and what I think we need to do more about is we do need to ensure that parents, parents who need additional support with their own literacy and numeracy needs, that they indeed can access that support, whether it's in colleges, whether it's through adult learning, whether it's through community learning and development. And we've already started uh, some of this work with a very ambitious uh, statement uh, on adult learning, because the evidence does indeed uh, tell us uh, that parents' involvement and their own literacy and numeracy is absolutely vital in terms of uh, raising attainment for all children. John Lamar. Come what the Cabinet Secretary has said, but would encourage her again to reflect on what I said about support staff at secondary school stage. We do know that boys in particular drop out of the system in first and second year. That explains the level of literacy for some um, young adults. And it's, if we sort that, it actually means that we can we have a less of a problem at a later stage. Cabinet Secretary. I am encouraged uh, by Ms. Ms. Lamont, and if I you know, could say that I am uh, not blind to the, the gender challenges either for, for young women or indeed uh, for, for young men, um, can I say that in terms of the issue that she raised with regards to classroom assistance, there's not actually been a fall in classroom assistance. It, it has increased by 6% from 5,700 to in excess of 6,000. But nonetheless, we do have to, to recognise uh, while this government is absolutely committed to maintaining teacher numbers, there is a wider uh, education and uh, learning uh, co community. 
Presiding officer, what this uh, government has not done and what this government uh, will absolutely never do is allow austerity to limit our ambitions for our children and our for our young people. And that's why we have proceeded with a £100 million fund uh, through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, which will, in the first instance, reach 50% of Scotland's poorer children. But, of course, we want to reach all of Scotland's children. And we will continue to pick up the pace with this work and say something soon uh, about how other areas uh, in Scotland can benefit, particularly those areas uh, with deep entrenched uh, pockets of poverty. And I would also like to uh, clarify for, for some members that, that the total revenue spending on schools it has risen by £208 million. And I know that councils plan to spend more on education in 2014-15 than they did last year. And of course, we will see whether this has been borne out with figures that are due to be published uh, later on in the week. And if I can also add, uh, presiding officer, there are indeed more disadvantaged young people going to university under this government than the previous. But we know we have more to do and we need to improve this area. And that's why we are proceeding uh, with the work underseen uh, by the Commission for Widening Access. Presiding officer, curriculum for excellence uh, is a success story, but time stands still for, for no one. And the Accounts Commission report in 2014 mentioned uh, by Mary Scanlon, it shows that performance has improved against all 10 of the attainment measures that have been examined over the past decade. And we know that the proportion of young people with low or no qualifications uh, has fallen further and faster under this government. But while I can point to disadvantaged young people achieving more and better qualifications, we know that the gap still remains. So, for example, a third of our most deprived young people left school with at least one higher. And while that is up from 20%, but the gap that remains is massive, with 82% of children from the least deprived communities leaving with one, one higher. And that's why I want to pick up on the point raised by Liz Smith, that this has to be about raising attainment for all children, as well as closing the attainment gap. All of our children have to be challenged throughout their educational journey, but they also have to be cherished and cared for at the same time. And if I can say to Liz Smith and Ian Gray that while we will honestly and dispassionately um, appraise where we are today in education, likewise we should be very careful about not hankering back to the past and looking at our past educational performance uh, through uh, rose-tinted glasses. We have to be very firmly focused on concentrating on the future. My final point, presiding officer, is that some speakers have made very uh, personal reflections in today's debate, and I want to end on a personal note, um, because I'm a, an education secretary who, once upon a time, was a kid with a free school meals ticket from a family and a community that in today's parlance is described as poor or disadvantaged. And I'm very thankful because at times I was very well supported but there were also at times where I was held back or written off. And therefore, while you know, at times I am far less than word perfect and not all that polished, I do have a grit and a determination and indeed an anger that in resource-rich Scotland no child should be left behind. And we must have the highest expectations and the highest hopes and dreams and aspirations for all our children. Because if I had to have one mantra, it would be this. If it is not good enough for my son, it is not good enough for anybody's child. And it is most certainly not good enough for Scotland's poorest children. And as a government, we will absolutely do everything to eradicate poverty. We're not going to lie down to it. We will do everything, despite our limitations, to overcome it. Because what is the alternative? Our children don't deserve our anguish, presiding officer. They deserve our anger and they deserve action. And we are most certainly not powerless in this. And my very final point, presiding officer, is we must now proceed with courage. Courage to have a conversation with each other and courage to challenge each other. And the courage to embrace, debate and be led by the evidence to ensure that every child and every community has every chance.
thank you. That concludes the debate on equity and excellence in education. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 13264 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for the week. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13264. Formally moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13264, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is decision time. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to today's debate, if the amendment in the name of Ian Gray is agreed, the amendments in the name of Liz Smith and Liam MacArthur fall. The first question then is that amendment number 13246.2 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend motion number 13246 in the name of Angela Constance on equity and excellence in education be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13246.2 in the name of Ian Gray is as follows. Yes, 47. No, 58. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I remind members now that if the amendment in the name of Liz Smith is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Liam MacArthur falls. So, the question is that amendment number 13246.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 13246 in the name of Angela Constance on equity and excellence in education be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13246.1 in the name of Liz Smith is as follows. Yes, 13. No, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 13246.3 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend motion number 13246 in the name of Angela Constance on equity and excellence in education be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13246.3 in the name of Liam MacArthur is as follows. Yes, 17. No, 64. 
There were 29 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 13246, in the name of Angela Constance, on equity and excellence in education, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13246 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows yes 67 no 13 there were 30 abstentions the motion is therefore agreed to Mr Lyle do you have a point of order you don't have a point of order no you don't have to Mr Lyle well it's I, I believe it was 13264 not 13264 246. Did I get it right? I just say, Mr Lyle, it wasn't a point of order. It could have been a point of information, but I have been assured by the clerk that I actually called it properly this time. And can I also remind all members that we do not have points of order during decision time. So, that concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.